Welcome to Virtual Meditation with Shiloh. Uh, hello? Today I, oh. we're working on forgiving ourselves for not knowing the difference between upload and download speeds before getting cable internet. <laughs> That's oddly specific. Repeat after me. I am not my cable internet. Wait, um, I, I, I don't have cable. I'm not a bad... If my video calls more like video stalls. Uh, hey Shiloh, there's something... I will get AT&T Fiber. <laughs> And I will switch classes until you do. Slow upload speeds? You're not a bad person. You just need better internet. With 20 times faster upload speeds, AT&T Fiber delivers a faster internet experience than cable. Get AT&T Fiber with no annual contract. Limited availability in select areas. Call 1-877-ONLY-ATT. Check eligibility at att.com slash get fiber. Based on combined internet 1000 wired up and download capacity versus major cable providers 1 gig service with uploads of 35 megabits per second. Speeds vary, not guaranteed. Restricted supply. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Is that Shakespeare? Nope, it's Geico. Uh, yeah, 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 that's Shakespeare from one of his unpublished works. Oh, it be not for awakening. Nay, give it thou the berries. For 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. No, it's from Geico, because they help save people money. Well, I hate to break it to you, but Geico got it from Shakespeare. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Thank you for visiting ChristopherMedia.net. From Asthma Core Studios near Detroit, Michigan, it's Unregimented. Gangsters, what's up, guys? And now, here are your hosts. Welcome to Unregimented number 170. Good Lord, we just, seems like we just started back up. We're piling back up, getting closer to 200 every episode. I'm Chris. I'm Aaron. I am Rich. And who boy. All right. Yeah. Yeah, so Puxatani Phil, huh? <laughs> yeah. Dude, Rich, thank you, dude. That was the best, that was the highlight of my day, dude. Oh, what's hashtag, that? Hashtag, <laughs> hashtag not my groundhog. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> Dude, that was the that was the bright spot of my fucking day, man. That was great. Well, I figured you'd enjoy it. I found it. I got a chuckle out of it. I thought it was fucking hilarious. Right. Oh, I mean, it, 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 hey, at least that protest would have had like a lot more focus than just <laughs> yeah, I know. You know, right? hey ho, this penis party's got to go. You know, <laughs> instead, <laughs> instead of guys just holding signs that say "fuck Phil." <laughs> the, the exactly. Last protest that erupted at uh, at UC Berkeley was seemed rather focused. Really? Before yeah. we get into it, I just can I point out the irony that fifty years ago they marched for freedom of speech. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, and then dude, fifty dude, years dude. later they rioted because they didn't like what fucking Milo Yiannopoulos was going to say. But Joe you know, McCarthy would love these new extreme liberals, man. Like, they, they would fucking have lots to talk about. But the, the concept of free speech has been twisted like every other concept is. I mean, we take, uh, like, the word troll. Troll is just uh, everybody that we don't like that says something that we don't agree with on the Internet now. Sa- same news, thing with a same, hater. Same thing, yeah. And Yeah, hater. If I don't like the news, it's fake news. If I don't like your criticism, you're a hater. And so it's so right. we can dismiss people. Right. And... The fact that that uh, Milo Yiannopoulos is using free speech as the shield is kind of ridiculous to me. Free speech doesn't mean that everybody gets a turn to go on a college tour, right? And if he's prevented from doing college tours, that has nothing to do with infringing on his freedom of speech. He still has freedom of speech out there. He's got a fucking book deal. Like... <laughs> Nobody, point, is, nobody is 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 actively uh, or nobody's silencing Milo Yiannopoulos, right? On the Berkeley campus, they did. That's not the same thing. The co- That's not the college free hired him. The college hired him to come speak. It was yes, a they hired was him, a, and the and it the was students. Two hundred. It was a two hundred seat venue, and he sold it out. Obviously, sure. there is an audience in the college. Realize that. Yes, but what is this? What uh, is there destroying was also a college large property. audience that was that was against him being there because they didn't like what he represented. 
So isn't that their freedom of speech to demonstrate and setting aside the violence if we can for a second because it's the well, no, you, can, you can't set aside no, the violence because that's what second. stopped it. No, I, I'm not saying that we can separate violence from what happened, at, but if we're going to talk about the issue of free speech, let's set aside for a second the issue of violence and just focus on what, what constitutes free speech. And somebody uh, protesting... Uh, someone else that has been paid to speak at a university and that preventing him from speaking is not infringing on his rights as free speech. It but doesn't that didn't prevent him from that did not prevent him from speaking. He's he's, he's I'm saying been if it, in marches in the Middle East in gay pride parades in the Middle East. Right. OK. No. He, right. We I agree. He's not. He, he he is not have been a, so far prevented from speaking. But part of what he is part of his his platform is that his his uh words are protected by free speech and that is correct the things that whether you agree whether you agree with him or not and honestly as much as i think he's a d-bag i'm 50 50 with what i agree with him on there's some things that actually make a lot of sense and there's others where i'm just like well you kind of make sense but you're also being extremely hateful and i don't see how that really furthers your idea but Oh, exactly. That, I got a love hate relationship about, with the guy myself. Right. So when yeah, we talk about, about freedom of speech, his his freedom of speech is not being impinged upon. There there are people out there who would rather him not have a book deal and just shut up and go away. But that's not the uh, country that we live in. That but we're is not talking about the people who demonstrate and don't do anything. They're talking. But, we're, I, we're talking about once you once you bring violence and destruction into it, that's where the rub is. He, okay, okay. This is this is what but I'm getting I, at. But I would you say, you say against plenty of time. You say his freedom of speech isn't being infringed upon right. by them protesting. You're yes. right. By them protesting, it's not. But when even if, well, these, let me clarify, even if he had to cancel his speech, his freedom of speech would still not be affected. But the reason that Berkeley wouldn't let him talk, or it was canceled, or whatever the fuck, because I'm sure there's going to be many different stories coming out from many different people. Because that's how it is these days, and then everybody will report on it, and then people will just pick what facts they like and call the rest of it fake news. The, the point is, if there wasn't a level of violence that kept just growing exponentially during that protest mm -hmm. to the point where it became a riot, yes. he would have spoke. He has spoke many times. He was on Joe Rogan talking about, I'm, I, I was in a gay pride parade in the Middle East where they kill homosexuals. Right. I, my life was threatened. I didn't stop me from going. The, the, so the so obviously that, that level of violence at Berkeley got to the point where somebody pulled the plug on that shit. But the, that, it may not be infringement on freedom of speech, but it's criminal. It was the cops, the university cops. They said they couldn't guarantee the safety of him or the people attending the event, so that's why they pulled the plug. Rich, Rich, I, I, I need to ask you for clarification on that. What do, you, what do you think is criminal about that? I'm, I'm not sure I understand it. Committing acts of violence. Well, committing because acts you don't of like someone. Yes, that's yeah, because criminal. you don't okay. like someone speaking. It doesn't matter. Okay, at a certain. Yes. Okay, here's the bottom line. According to the law, it doesn't matter why you committed the crime. You committed a crime. Yes. Okay. No, okay. I mean, there's, I, there's, that's what I'm getting at. That's what they, they're committing crimes to get to stop something they don't like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're taking well, discourse off the table. And he's not committing a crime. He's not, he's not going... I've never seen a speech. True. I've seen a speech where he rips into celebrities, where he calls third-wave feminism a bunch of ugly, you know, fat trolls he, he says and all that shit. But yeah. I've never seen him get up there and advocate for getting rid of an entire race, getting rid of an entire religion. You know, I've never oh, seen. Well, I've he never heard him talk about ethnic cleansing and shit. I believe I don't know how far his stance goes on other religions. Uh, he may be just anti-religion in general. He's definitely outspoken about the Muslim religion. Him and Joe and, Rogan, and, according according to according to the Joe Rogan, it was the latest one he was on. So if anyone mm -hmm. wants to go listen to it, you can go to Joe Rogan's site, search it, look it up. I think he's been on two or three of them, but the last one he was on. Him and Joe Rogan were talking, and Joe Rogan was like, what is your beef with religion? He goes, I have no beef with religion. I consider myself a Catholic. And he's like, you're okay. a gay Catholic. Do you understand how silly that is? And he goes, I understand. I don't adhere to all the Catholic principles, whatever. 
Mm-hmm. And he said, what's your problem with, with the religion of Islam? And what's your problem with Islam? And that's when they started talking about almost all of other Abrahamic religions, religions that came from the Desert Trilogy, those three books, the Quran, the Torah, or the Bible. Mm-hmm. Except, for the, except, for the, except for the Quran and, and, and Islam, those other two religions and all their offshoots went through the Age of Enlightenment and adjusted their beliefs and their preaching right. on, on a large scale. Of course, you have hardcore people always. Those are people that are bombing abortion clinics. Those are the people that God hate fags group. There's always yeah, going to be extremists. people like that. Yes. Okay. Problem with Islam is, and this is, I'm paraphrasing him and Joe Rogan, so you can send the hate mail to both of them if you want, is that they both agreed on that. And they said the problem with Islam is that there is a, let's just say, was it six billion people on the planet? Three billion of them are Muslims or whatever, you know, claim to be or whatever claim that is or religion. And even if it's as low as 5% of that number, are extremists or people who support extreme, you know, sheer law or something right. like that. Yes. That's an issue. That's a problem. Extremists That's in the a, way that, are, like, if so, if somebody rapes your wife, you have to stone her to death. Or or if you have a gay son, you got to throw him off a roof or some shit like that. Yeah. Right. Those, those are you human rights. Two planes into two skyscrapers. Those are human rights violations disguised and, 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 and cloaked in... Well, it's my religious freedom. No, at least in at least here in the states, you don't have religious freedom. Your religious freedom stops when you start to impose violence upon other people. You, yeah, your religious freedom stops at where other people's freedoms start, including their freedom to be, you know, uh, the freedom from violence. Yeah, yeah. And so I kind of, my- I kind of agree with what they said. Islam, for the most part is still stuck in 500, 600 years ago in a lot of the more, I don't know if you call it orthodox, hardcore, evangelical, whatever. You know, because mm-hmm. if it's Christians, or they're, they're the evangelical Christians. And those are the hardcore ones that, that bother me. You know, the, the I guess if you're Jewish, it'd be like the super orthodox Jews who are like, you know, the, you know, the, the, the shit over in the Middle East with, with the Gaza Strip and in, in Israel and in Palestine and all that. I don't know what you would call the Muslims, but those are the, those people are a fucking problem, and they're not just a problem to Western society and non-Muslims and non-believers. They're a problem to each other. I mean, they war with each other. It's it it, per, it it's no different than if the whole world was Christian. You know, eventually Catholics and Protestants would go back at it like it was in Northern Ireland again. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, the majority of the Middle East is, I don't know what we would call it bef- now, I, I guess it, in the 80s, I would have just called them a third world, uh, but I guess that's derogatory now, so developing nation, maybe? Uh, not all of it, but... See, third world, the third world nation always meant to me is that there's there's the two superpowers, and if you aren't part of the superpowers... <laughs> and everybody else is then number you're, three. Yeah. Then, well, then you're not a, you're not a superpower, right. and developing nation was for... Like I would say, India is a developing nation. China is a developing nation. China, you could probably say. Uh, is I don't a know if I would classify as that. Yeah. Well, anyway, it, semantics on that aside, uh, the um, a major part of the reason why they, let's say, aren't as powerful a presence in the in the world as they could be, especially considering how much of everything that the rest of the world uses comes from the Middle East. And I'm not just talking about oil. I'm talking about numbers and all that shit too, language. Um, math right uh, but if they would have actually progressed with their religion at the same time at the same pace that uh, Judaism and Christianity did they would be far better off and probably have far less of these religious extremists in their midst and, and uh, be a wealthier and more powerful nation not nation I mean I'm referring to the Middle East as all one nation but it's not a uh, region, let's say. Hey, am I the only one? You know, and maybe you guys can 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 commiserate with me, or maybe not. Am I the only one who saw like the deep, 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 deep irony in people who uh, were holding pro-Muslim signs at the airport this weekend that were probably at the women's march talking about human rights? Mm-hmm. Is that just me seeing that no, irony. I, I know, I saw it. Because it's like, I want to tell, like, half of these people, like, uh, you want to go just try and have a vagina over there? See what happens? 
Like, try, try to have this march over there. Good luck. That's right, that's but, a, that's, but the support that, of Muslims is more saying that welcoming people that actually want to come to this nation. Uh, I get so, it, but but still, just be a, just just be a, be a woman in a Muslim country. Even even the even the ones that aren't extremists, like they are still super backwards in the way they treat women. I don't know. I you think know, there's a lot to be the said. The quote unquote about, good ones. There's a lot to be said about being the bigger person. No, I mean you can be the bigger person all you want. You get caught in the wrong area of the Middle East that is more extreme in their in their in taking that well, yeah. book literally, and you're, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how tolerant of a person you are. Yes, but you're fucked. I've been mugged by black people in Detroit. I don't hate all black people. I don't think that all black people are going to mug me. No, I don't either. But if I see a black person say, come here, white boy, waving a gun in my face, I don't think they want me to come over and talk about the magic, the gathering cards he just picked up at the card shop. No, I know, but you're, you're equating women supporting Muslims in general as a hypocrisy because of how some Muslims view women. It's not some Muslims. It's all, whether they, they're extremist or not, the, the, how well, they view women is, is okay. it's all that's part of the religion. Mm, all right. Well, let's meet somewhere in the middle then, because some, uh, my rough estimate of some Muslims is probably way under, but you can't ever say all. There are progressive people who consider themselves to be Muslim, who follow the Islamic religion, and are also not hateful and controlling of women and keeping them in beekeeper suits. Absolutely. Really? I mean, go to Hamtram and count the hijabs, man, or hijabs, okay. or whatever you want to call it. Go to Dearborn and count the hijabs. Well, you you're, also making the, the you're also making the assumption that the... everyone wearing hijab is oppressed. Uh, yeah? You can't show your face and you can't show your hair? Okay, but like, wait a minute. Is that we, really progressive? Catholics, Catholics have nuns that, that, that wear head coverings. Orthodox Jews have women, women that wear head coverings. I mean that's this, the, the difference that's is not that just, nobody's uh, killing them. That's not them. just an issue. That's I'm, I'm not going to say problem, but that's not just an issue that's isolated to to Islam. Right, but the difference is nobody's killing Correct. them for taking them off. Yes, but the nuns make a choice to wear that stuff. A lot of the Orthodox Jews make a choice to wear that yes, stuff. A lot of the, nowadays, nowadays, yes, yeah. and there are there are Muslim women who make a choice to do that and have no problem with it themselves. There are. I'm I'm just saying that it's. I, I'm not saying that I know somebody and I can bring them in here and have you meet them, but I know for a fact that there are people who wear hijabs and don't feel any oppression because of it. It's, it's, you can't make the automatic statement that if you see somebody wearing that, they must be oppressed. And a hijab is different than full body covering, head to toe, except for the eyes showing. I mean, that's, that's, that's the extreme right. end of things right. versus... Versus a woman who Keeping believes the hair that, covered. yeah, she should scarf keep her hair covered unless she's in front of, I, I guess the rule is family until she's married, then it's her husband and children. I, I, and I mean, look, I don't give a shit. My, my problem is, is when they, they and, and this would be a nun, this would be if, if it was still a tenet of Catholicism that all, that all nuns had to have. You know that the flying nun hat, and you know, or and if and if Jews had to have a yarmulke on at all times, or whatever the fuck. Okay, that's cool. But when it comes to shit like, all right, we're getting our driver's license taken. I don't take this off. It's against my religion. Then you don't drive. Have a nice one. Next, bottom line, I don't give a shit about your religion. Our laws uh, are: if you want a driver's license. Which is, we're so fond to point out these days in this country, the land of the free. Everything's a privilege almost. People tell you, it's not a right to do this. It's a privilege. Well, driving is yeah. a privilege. Well, yes, so but, if you don't want to take your fucking head gear off, then you don't get a license. On, if she's going to drive with it on, what's the problem with her having her picture taken with it on? And change the law. Okay. But you can't change the law for one religion. You have to. You, you, mm -hmm. you can't. Because that is against separation of church and state then is showing preferable treatment to one religion over another right it has to it's just like this whole thing you know people go you can't pray in school that's not fucking true and anyone that says that is either being willfully obtuse or they're fucking ignorant of the law you can't a teacher cannot get up and lead a prayer in school 
If you want to pray in school, you can pray all the fuck you want. We had we had kids who came in who were uh, the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses who refused to say the Pledge of Allegiance. So the teacher said, well, "What would you rather do? Well, I'd rather have a moment of prayer." To you know, okay, well then sit down while everyone else is standing and saying the pledge and say your prayer. Just don't disrupt the class. No one gave, no big deal. It's when people are like, "No, no, we have to have these." These prayer rooms for my religion, and we have to have these these mats and all this and my religion. Well, you know what? Your religion does not mean the rest of everybody else has to make you comfortable. You your right. religion ultimately is something you chose. You you it's not like this. It's not like your skin color, your eye color, your hair color, your genetics. You can't help those things. You were just born with them. You chose that religion, or it was forced upon you. And you're too young because you're still a child to tell your parents, fuck off with this nonsense. That's not our problem. That's not the rest of our problem. And I'm sorry, but that carries over into adulthood. I can't get up there and wear a baseball hat and say, uh, yeah, you know, uh, it's part of my religion. People I'm a baseballist. Worship, people that worship the flying spaghetti, spaghetti monster can't get up there with a strainer on their head talking about it's part of my religion. I mean, because that's what it's going to get to. It's going to get to that nonsense. People claiming that shit. The Pope has to take his big head off in his driver's license photo. So if you want to, if you want to change the law, okay, put it out there. Oh, oh, you're saying they can't wear the spaghetti strainer for their driver's license picture? Exactly. Okay, okay. I thought That's they just couldn't about. wear it in general. I'm like, why can't they wear it? <laughs> no, you, you could. You're, sure. You'll look like yeah, an yeah, ass, yeah. but you, you can wear it all you want. I wouldn't right. recommend it. But yeah. But what I'm saying is, if you want to change the law to where they can. But it's not specifically for Muslims or Jews or Christians or whatever, Catholics, whatever the fuck. Fine. Right. Then if your religion stipulates that you, a part of it is wear some headgear, that's fine. Bottom line, we need to see your face. It's an ID. You can't get up there with just your eyes showing. So that's where the line's got to be drawn. And right. this is this is... And Chris referred to this last week. This is I don't have a problem with people saying it's a slippery slope. I got a problem with people saying you can't say in a debate, you can't use the slippery slope argument because I think it's been proven in the last 20 years slippery slope is exactly what the fuck we started need to start using in debates because it is well, I think proven it's a- to be a fact. Once you start down a road, sometimes you ain't coming back. In many cases though to me slippery stro- slope reads as progress when somebody says well this is a slippery slope to this or that and usually the sometimes these are outrageous things that would never happen like two guys get married and that's a slippery slope to a guy marrying a dog and i'm like oh, really sure i mean you be, people, I, I, I i we'll see in 50 years man i'm telling you the internet has freaks of all types and i don't say freaks as in they're bad people i'm just saying but but having that marriage recognized by the government is a totally different thing yeah, I, I there, guarantee there are already you people before, married to their dogs. I'm aware of I, that. I guarantee you, before, <laughs> my, I think my grandmother was the last 10 years of her life. Come on uh, <laughs> no, I mean, like, seriously. I, I think she treated that dog better than she ever treated any <laughs> of her husbands. But she was always out of peanut butter? <laughs> yeah, I know that dog ate better. She cooked better for him. <laughs> well, I bet it ate But, <laughs> but uh, um, I guarantee you, before the last one of us three suck our last fucking breath, we're going to see a movement that's going to get legitimate traction. I'm not saying a whole lot of traction, but mm-hmm. legitimate traction for pedophiles to be accepted in our society. I guarantee it. I well, guarantee it. I, I now, think- I'm, the difference is I'm not drawing a line between gay marriage and pedophilia because mm-hmm. being gay has nothing to do with being a pedophile. Right. That's where the people make the mistake. Um, okay. It doesn't have anything to do with it, yes. Uh, I, there's a correlation in some idiots' minds that one leads to the other in a direct result. On both result. sides, by on the a, way. On a, on both a, sides, by the way. On, on both sides, it. clarify. Oh, oh, at, people who are opposed to it and people who are in support of it. Because people who are opposed to it are going to go, this is what happens when we let them fags get married. Oh, and people right. who are in favor of it are going to go, well, if you have no problem changing the traditional marriage from a man to a woman to two men or two women or even polygamy or whatever the fuck, well, then what's the problem with, you know, uh, adult child love? Because mm-hmm. th- that's what I'm saying. That's where the slippery slope happens. Because right. these people are fucked and they're going to use any, ex- 
you give them an inch of rope, and all of a sudden they're trying to make a lasso and be a fucking cowboy out there. But but a lot of the issues that we're wrestling with as a society these days tends to revolve around, um, well, the difference between something you can control and can't control. Something you, like for example, you were talking about you're not born with religion, right? It is something that you you are choosing to do. And your freedom should have certain limits when they start imposing on other people's freedoms, right? But on the other side, we have things that you can't control, things that you are born with. And the majority of this nation is starting to come around to homosexual, homosexuality being understood as something that just is. It's not a choice. Uh, the same thing now with being transgendered. Um, shit, even Drew from Drew and Mike, I was listening to his podcast today, and they were talking about the whole Boy Scout thing. And they were talking very positively about this poor kid who was kicked out of the Boy Scouts, or I don't know if it kicked out or just wouldn't uh, wasn't allowed to join. But um, you know, whereas if I was listening on morning radio to him twenty years ago, they'd be like, "This freak! What are they? These kids are raising their kids as a, some freak," you know. So we have made a, a lot of progress on certain things, but when you talk about Okay, so homosexuality is something that you can't control. You are born with it. If you believe that, um, and I'm not equating the two, just to be perfectly clear, but if you believe mm. that pedophilia is a disease, something that somebody is born with and they can't control, well, there does have to be a certain amount of acceptance, right? I'm not saying believe, an acceptance of the behavior, but an acceptance believe, of who the person is and try and deal with that? I believe people are wired that way. Mm -hmm. That people have sexual urges towards children, and they right. don't know why they don't want them. I've, anybody who's, who's spent any time or, you know, I'm not even, in, uh, in, in, in studying psychology knows that there are most pedophiles do not offend, right. especially nowadays with the Internet. Right. Most well, pedophiles get busted because they're looking at pictures or acts that were recorded by people who mm -hmm. di committed the actual act. Okay, which is still, I mean, it's still fucked up, obviously, because that, a child was still harmed to get that. Okay? Right, yes. But it's, they try to I, placate, pacify, I don't know what would be the right word, uh, uh, their their urges, and so they don't go out and start being like that with children. And, and look, I I, I I guess that people go, you you have sympathy for them. I have sympathy for the fact because I, I not sympathy. I'm going to put this. Yeah, well, I don't know what it's I don't know what it's like to look at a man and go, I'm attracted to a man. I don't know what it's like to look at a child and go, I'm attracted to a child. Uh huh. But I know that at a certain point in my life, it has scared the shit out of me to be attracted to a man, and not know why. When all my friends are attracted to to to, to girls, right. and I'm sitting here going, you know, I'm attracted to boys. What, what the fuck's wrong with me? It it it, it is scared the shit out of me, and right. that's become accepted. But I don't think pedophilia will ever be accepted. So, well, I guess you I, know, it, I want to clarify one thing. I was talking about things that you can't control and that you're born with. It it's really not so much that you're born. With. I mean, it almost. All cases, pedophilia is something that was actually put upon a person. It was some sort of abuse that was put upon that person that made them into a pedophile. It doesn't change the amount of control that person has over it. But um, yeah, but there's that's that's eh, that's 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 a, that's an aspect of it. There's been plenty of studies where kids, as they grow up. Are, are at a young age, they start showing sexual interest at kids their age, and as they continue to mature, their sexual interest doesn't in 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 people stays with kids of that age. Right, but that but that is a developmental problem, and probably and they were never and they were and never you probably trace themselves. that directly back to their upbringing. It doesn't have to be that one is uh, is directly molested. I'm just saying abuse in general is, could be broad base. I mean, they could just be, uh, you know, sheltered and never really allowed to mature as a person. And so they the Michael Jackson in this, theory. Yeah. Something like that, where they're allowed to remain in this childlike state. And so their desires don't mature with the, with them as, uh, as everybody else's does. Although, 
you know, <laughs> there's where the, the conflict with nature versus nurture comes in. I mean, I remember when I was starting to be aware of my own sexual feelings and certainly there were girls in my class who I thought were cute and everything, but you lusted ultimately after women, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> even, even when you're a kid, the concept of flat chest didn't turn you on. you the ultimate prize was there of like somebody with boobs you knew you liked boobs. You did not know why. You just speaking, knew you liked them. Right. Yeah. Right. Speaking of speaking of Boy Scouts, my Boy Scout troop marched in a parade uh-huh. for I think it was like Memorial Day or something. And my dad was the troop leader, and I was one of the flag bearers. You know, and right in front of us, as you're waiting, queued in line for you know to to get to start. You know, obviously parade. First group goes. Second group goes. Right. Right. The group in front of us was the high school cheerleaders, and I'm all of like, Ooh, I'm like 10. And so I just start throwing on the bullshit charm to the point where. Years old? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm oh, 10 yeah. years old. I'm throwing on the bullshit. I'm throwing on the bullshit charm. And like, this is a story that's, 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 that's like legendary in my family because finally these girls were like so surprised that I was coming off so fucking slick to them. They turned to my dad, who they had no idea was my dad, who was the, who was the scout leader, and said, you sure he's not a midget or something? Like, you sure he's not, like, you know, <laughs> like, seriously, if, like, he's got he's got a better rap than some of the, most of the guys in our high school. <laughs> and my dad, you know, was like, he didn't say, that's my boy, but he was, like, afterwards, he, he told, when he told the family, he's like, that's my boy. That's right. Put put that bullshit charm on them, girl. And I'm just, yeah, of it's course. It's want to fuck my son. <laughs> <laughs> of course, man. I mean, of course you're a tra- You know, but you when you, when when you start f- figuring out, you know, oh shit, that thing down there, I can do more than just piss out of. You don't <laughs> you don't you don't pick up a, a Girl Scout calendar and be like, oh. Oh, that's hot. No, you look for your dad's Playboy <laughs> right. or your mom's, you know, Victoria's Secret or something. I do remember I was in grade school. Or, you know, and, when you're uh, our some, age, Sears catalog. Somebody you know, had uh, yeah. it, somebody had some confiscated porn from, you know, some father's stash. And we were out in front of the grade school and they were showing it off. Hey, here's what naked women look like. Check it out. And I was I was looking at it and I was like, how come my penis feels all weird and tingly when I look at this? <laughs> I said out loud, and everyone just kind of looked down at the ground and, <laughs> and pretended like they didn't hear me. And I'm like, all right, well, so I guess that's uh, that was my first lesson about sex right there. People don't like talking about it generally in open. <laughs> hey, guess what? Aaron doesn't know what a boner is. I don't, No, I don't think it was like... It might have been shame, like, oh, this kid doesn't know shit, but I think they were... Shameful because they had no more answers than I did. No, my friends were ruthless. Mind you, or they were just staring down at their dicks. <laughs> my friends were ruthless. If, if after probably about the age of like nine, ten, if you didn't claim to know everything about sex, like you better fake it because if not, they were going to ride you like mercilessly. Oh yeah, there's a lot they, of they were assholes. Until you make it, you know, it's it's no bullshit. It's kind of like that scene in. Uh, yeah, but they also it. didn't know. The ones who knew oh, yeah. didn't know. <laughs> yeah, it's like the scene in it when they're talking about how babies are made, and one guy's like, what you do is you rub your dick against yeah. a piece of soap, and then you got to pee in a girl's belly button, and then nine months later, the baby comes out. And they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> I love that part. <laughs> <laughs> but if you say it with enough conviction, people will be like, oh, yeah, oh, that's, what, that's how babies are made. Okay. <laughs> right. Well, uh, so. we also... It, we hit this weird point as kids in that preteen going into teen years where uh, our parents told us all kinds of shit that we are now realizing was false, including Santa Claus and every other visitor that they claimed came to the, the house. And, yeah, boy. And so now this weird shit is happening that nobody really wants to talk about. So, we are much more apt to believe our peers at that age than we are our parents. Even if we yeah, heard it from mom, them, we wouldn't, we wouldn't hear it, right? Mom and dad have been bullshitting me for 10 years, and I ain't listening to them. Right. 
Well, when my dad died, my his little brother was nine. His vagina sounds as mythical as Santa Claus. <laughs> when, when, I know, right? That's, that's made up. Nothing Come bleeds on. for five days and you don't die. That's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, when my, when my dad died, my little brother was nine. And, my, you know, my stepmother, through the process of the funeral and the burial and everything, at one point she's like, well, I guess, you know, it's up to, like, your uncle or you to have, you know, let them know about certain things, you know, because I'm a, I'm a female. I don't know about And I'm like, I'm going to tell you what, be honest with them. That's because, like, and she was completely uncomfortable with it. And I'm like, he's nine. He should already know. At least, I mean, I'm not talking about he should know, like, yeah, so uh, what you do is you get her upside down, you, p- you put her on, on the small over, and then you start jackhammering her. That's called lawnmower position. Like, you know, he don't need to know all that. You know, but he, the very I mean, much, help. the basics, you know, I mean, yes, when, you know, a woman and a man have sex, he puts his penis in her vagina, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it, to me, at nine years old, ten years old, there's no shame in knowing that. But, and she was just so uncomfortable, but, you know. And yeah, you remember, because, he was a change of life baby for her, so she was quite older than most of the other mothers in her peer group. So, because of all this, all the progress that we seem to have made accepting other other people, we're still ashamed of ourselves and our own sexuality, even to the point where we don't want girls to get a shot to prevent cervical cancer because we think that promotes sex. <coughs> Retarded. Well, isn't it the, the the same rationale with the birth control pill when it first came out? Yes. Oh, you should, you should have women on this. It'll encourage them to have sex without making a baby. I remember can't telling have my, that. I remember telling my daughter's mother when my daughter was two and a half. I was like, "We need to start crushing these bastards up, and putting them in like her mashed potatoes." And she's like, "What? She's two and a half." I'm like, "Yeah, bitch." Fine. And we're we're young parents ourselves. So if she's a if she's if she's a mama's girl or a daddy's girl, either way, there's a chance she'd come home and be like, guess what? Y'all going to be grandparents. It's like, wait a minute. Uh-uh, we ain't ready for this shit. <laughs> I heard if you start them real young, their ovaries will never fully develop. Yeah, it's like, I'm, <laughs> I, seriously, I wanted to be that guy like in the 40-year-old virgin. Like, how do I get her to stop ovulating? And she's like, is that a serious <laughs> question? He's like, I don't know. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> Like if I could, yeah, I just mm I look because kids are gonna fuck, and I've got I've got some friends who are going through this right now. Their oldest is getting ready to start her senior year, and I think when I think twelve or thirteen, they sat her down, and she knew the basics already. But then they gave her the, you know, look, this is a young age for if in our generation to start talking. But not in your generation. And she's like, oh, I've had girlfriends that said they've you know given blowjobs and been you know finger fucked and all this and you know they they're sitting there horrified and i'm like no be honest with her because here's the deal if she's going to have sex she's going to do it and what you are more concerned with because they're not religious at all i'm like what are you more concerned with her waiting to be a ridiculous age to have sex you know in you know post college or her having safe sex, not catching a venereal disease, or getting pregnant, or putting, or because of complete uh, a complete lack of knowledge about sex and teenage situations, being put in a position where she gets used by some scumbag, and they were like, "You're right." And they sat her down. And they were like, "Look, you know, if it gets to the point where you start dating and you need to go on birth control, let us know." And she's, you know, she did her little mi- middle school dating, high school. She started dating for real, and she went to her mom. And they put her on birth control, and that was the end of the discussion. It was no big deal, you know. I, I mean, I th- I'm sure the discussion went. Now, if you come home pregnant now, then you're a fucking idiot because you got no excuse to. So, uh, to me, that's just that's being it's being a it's being pragmatic about the situation. Mm-hmm. Kids are going to fuck. We did. Okay? And none of us were fucking Joe football player. None of us were the super cool fucking kids. All right? And we were fucking at an age that I'm sure most of our parents wish we hadn't have been. So imagine kids nowadays with the internet and the fact that sex is just such an open thing to talk about. Knowing what a blowjob is, you know, and, and you're 12 years old. Like, I knew because I'd heard about it, and I'd seen pornos, 
and my parents didn't know I knew about it. I didn't know that what that was because it's openly talked about on the nightly news because the president's, you know, getting one under the fucking That's table right, in the Oval Office. I mean, it's just... Yeah. The world changes. Man, I got a... Well, yeah. Twelve year old nephew, I can only, I can only fucking imagine what he knows. I'm like, man, I remember being your age. Who the fuck knows what you know? Well, the, Good the Lord, you know, pre-internet, we were probably better off wandering around mostly in the dark. Yeah, he didn't. We didn't. We didn't have Pornhub. We didn't have X Hamster. Well, right, because I mean, we've seen what comes out of ninety nine percent of porn. And it's ridiculous. It's uncomfortable positions and unnecessary shit. Some of it's even abusive. And these are, if that's all that kids are seeing as being representative of sex, that's a very bad role model right there for how a sex, a healthy sex life should actually be. Or at least until you figure out what you really like. I mean, if you're into yeah. you know tying up people and and a little rough play, a little rough trade, that's all fair game. But you know, if if what you're taught is sex is slapping a woman a couple times in the face and then coming on her, well, not everybody's going to be into that, and that's not the most healthy way to start. <laughs> I'm just trying not to anybody. imagine. Not anybody any fun anyway. I'm just trying to imagine some poor kid is like 10 years old, stumbles across a Max Hardcore video. Right. At 13, he gets a chick who's down to do shit. He just ends up pissing in her fucking... He, he, shows, <laughs> he, shows up, he shows up with a speculum, a straw hat, and a hard on, ready to piss in her fucking pried open vagina. And she's like, what the fuck? Twilight didn't prepare me for this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> kid finally goes to his dad. Dad, uh... How many dates should I wait before I start slapping a bitch? <laughs> Dad, when's an appropriate time to broach scat play? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, good times, man. It's hey. Well, this, is, this, is the, this, is the re, this is the reality of fucking kids these days. And we wonder how come they're, I, they, they, like, they are the way they are, mm-hmm. you know? I mean, seriously. Let's be honest here. This is this is stuff that was considered when we were kids very adult things, and it's right there for them for the taking. I mean, with every with your with you having a computer in your pocket in the form of a smartphone these days, it doesn't matter how many parental locks you put on your fucking PC at home, your laptop, your tablet, whatever. Some parents not going to have it on their kid's cell phone and some kid's going to fucking find the shit and it's going to be like passed around like a party joint we are probably the last age group where you had to know somebody to get some porno yep oh definitely you you had to know somebody who knew somebody who got it from his brother you know had some porno nowadays shit all my tech savvy friends were on the internet before I was eighteen, and they were fucking downloading like gifs and shit and mm-hmm. JPEGs of you know, of porn. And I was like, this thing fucking produces porn. Well, oh, finally, I have a use for computers. Get ready. <laughs> like when yeah. Quagmire found out about porn. Because I mean, we well, we already yeah. have we have virtual virtual reality sex already, um, which is only going to increase in popularity the more feedback they're able to give the user. Including like haptic suits and and different technologies for even using um, air as resistance to make it feel like you're touching something. It's funny you brought um, that up because I was just reading about uh, the new Resident Evil movie. Uh huh. Over in Japan, they have a uh, a VR. If you go see the movie in Japan, they have a VR experience set up, and they put you in a full body suit. Yeah. And uh, yeah, if you get hit, you actually feel it mm-hmm. in the suit. So I was like, me being, you know, type of guy I am, I'm like, oh, how long until this shit's been adapted for porn? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, come on. It'll be out in course. three months. Yeah. It'll, it'll be out for Christmas. Well, I, yeah, I was listening to Stuff You Should Know podcast. They did one, an episode about virtual sex today. And they were talking all about, uh, you know, the, the different technologies, but also the, the purposes for do- these technologies we were talking about pedophilia earlier, um, great subject that we should revisit already, uh, and the, the idea that you could have 
virtual child sex for therapeutic purposes. I know this seems like a really fucked up concept, but the idea that, again, if, if somebody is uh, a pedophile and you believe that they have no control over that behavior, maybe actually giving them a virtual child to have sex with will take care of the problem uh, and, and stop behavior now. That's the, weird. Okay, look. Sure, it's I, weird. I'm, I'm you, wondering where you guys fall on this, though. Because didn't, didn't, Okay, that to me seems about as stupid as the Catholic Church going, we need a place for gay males and males attracted to children to go to where it won't be that big of an issue. We'll make the priesthood, and they got to be celibate. Perfect. That didn't solve the problem, you know. I'm sure, but I'm sure the, there's there's priests that are gay. Exasperated it. Well, and I, I was going to get to that, but I'm sure that if there's you know adult male gay priest, and you know they're all living together, I'm sure there's been some hookups. There's been some like broke back collar type shit going on, and then of course once you add ultra boys in there, and it just shit just got worse. You know, this to me sounds like a band aid on an issue that. We really need to start trying to tackle it. From yeah, but, what a, you, what, but it's kind of a different approach. Maybe though. that's where the I understand, I understand the similarities that you're drawing between the two, but I'm just saying it sounds but, but like it, it sounds like, like you're said, talking about it like oppression an, of a, of a problem, trying to p- sweep it under the rug and hope it goes away. Where with virtual reality uh, pedophilia therapy, whatever you might call it, is whether you agree with it or not, is tackling the problem head on. What I'm saying is if we're to the point where we can have virtual reality pedophilia porn, it's going to, 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 you know, give enough sustenance to these people, then what we really need to be working on is figuring out what in their brain is wired that to make them that way and how can we get rid of that, identify that, and get rid of that at a young enough age to where it stops being a well, problem. Uh, yeah, but it's not like diabetes, like, you, like I was I saying did, before, look, it, 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 it's it's nature versus nurture. There's always going to be people that are pedophiles. There's always going to be people that are are that have had trauma happen to them. They're going to try to reenact the trauma because of whatever psychic scars that were you know they carry. But it, there's just like I said, there's people that are like, look, I don't want this. I don't want to be this way, and they're sure. open about it in therapy. Ideally, we have a cure for it. Not, I agree with you, but we don't. And we are much closer to having uh, this Band-Aid of, of virtual sex that may actually help the problem. And who knows? It may make it worse. I'm not arguing for it or against it. I'm just kind of interested in the concept. Well, you but, also have to get over You also have to convince a very large group of people we think the only way to cure a pedophile is put a bullet in their head. And that's it. Yeah. There's no such thing as a, as a non-practicing pedophile. In their mind, if you're a pedophile, the only way to get rid of that problem is to kill them on sight. Mm-hmm. And as we've talked about before, uh, what, 350, 370 million people in this country? Yeah, we're a drop in the bucket compared to the rest of the world. And there's a lot of parts of the world that aren't as advanced and aren't as developed as us. And they may play a little bit more fast and loose with age of consent laws, but ultimately you get caught fucking a five, six-year-old, they're going to kill you, bottom line. Yeah, that's it. No no judge, no jury. Just right to the execution. Mm -hmm. Yep. And they'll get away with it, too. Right. Because people go, why did you kill this man? And then they just point to their son or daughter's bloody anus or vagina, and they go, I'll help you bury him. Drag him to the pig farm. Let's go. Yeah, but... I don't, but nobody's arguing whether, I mean, if we're talking about consequences for action on, on pedophilia, you'll hit, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a no-brainer. The maximum fucking sentence possible. Um, I would even be pro-death penalty for that if I had enough faith in our justice system. But, and then they wouldn't get perverted guess, into know, I, I, two high school kids have sex, and then you're, oh, you're a sex offender. Guess what? You know, Strap in and ride old Sparky. I, I guess there's, there's certain philosophical arguments that I'm more interested in in this, but it's just the behavior and the actions are so intertwined 
that it's impossible to separate it. I guess like before when we were talking about the protesters in hopes that we could just talk about freedom of speech and not the violence that happened, but it it's so closely related in that in that what incident that maybe there is no advantage in trying to separate that out and analyze it. Well, that's why a good psychiatrist are so hard to come by because they have to be able to compartmentalize mm-hmm. when they're talking to someone. I mean, fuck it, you know, in pop culture, perfect example, and it's right at our fingertips, the Sopranos. You know, Dr. Melfi treated Tony Soprano, and as a psychiatrist, she was able to compartmentalize his behaviors, right. his infidelities, and try to help him become a better person. But when he tried to actually get involved in a romantic relationship with her, she said, I wouldn't be able to do that. I would have to look at you in a different light and, and be yeah. blunt. Yeah, I like, find you repulsive in that aspect. Right, right. And, you know, that pretty much put the kibosh in any romance between those two for the rest of the series. But, I mean... Yeah, that shit that's got how, ugly. <laughs> that's, that's why a, true, a truly good therapist is so hard to find because people have a hard time. Now, a lot of people have a good poker face and they can sit there and listen to horrific shit being told to them in a therapy session. But to help the person, you have to realize that this person's... Uh, you have to all stop fundamental, judging them at a certain Yes, we're all, we're all fundamentally flawed. But these people are really damaged for whatever reason, whether it's because they were born that way, whether it's it was they they suffered trauma, whatever. And if you if your honest end game is to help them, then like you said, you have to you have to set your judgment aside. Right. And that is so hard to do. For I imagine priests and 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 who hear confession and and, and shit like that. I mean, mm-hmm. I, it's how come I I, I I you know I remember one time talking to a buddy of mine who's like hardcore Catholic and apparently one of the, the, the dirty little secrets about priests is there's a high rate of alcoholism. Yep. From the wine. And I never, I, mean, you, I never used to doing, doing like four shots of wine every Sunday. And I mean, too. And then the guys, they, they say mass every day. So a lot of these guys just get used to a, a little nipple wine every fucking day. And then it just snowballs. And then you, and if you're hearing confessions of of these these people, and you are truly you truly believe in it, you're not a cynical priest. You're not like, okay, whatever, say this many Hail Marys and Our Fathers, and you're good. And you're actually you actually believe in you know you're a proxy for God to forgive them. That shit has to weigh on you, and you you you're already drinking. Might as well you know, hey, I'm gonna drink to get this fucking shit out of my head. Or hey, to man, deal with it. When I was an altar boy, there was a couple of priests. They're like, oh, Father Mike, he, he gets grape juice. You know, and they're just mm-hmm. kind of like, you, you, knew, you knew why. You know, some, some priests got the wine, some priests are like, nope, you got to give him grape juice. All right. And, and yeah, it's, it's, they probably end up, you, you ever seen the Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, Rich? No. I know Aaron has. They oh, end yeah, up like I the love therapist. that show. Yeah, they end up like t- with Tina Fey when she's a therapist. You know, by day she's a good therapist, and then by night she's a fucking train wreck. Yeah. Like getting blackout drunk and shit, and like you know, like waking up covered in puke next to a fucking p- cop's horse or some shit like that. Well, I mean, I I have a few friends who went into the the therapy field, and uh, yeah, uh, you know, I, one or two of them have some some, some severe issues that when we talk one on one, they say they feel that the fact that they've the nature of their chosen profession has exasperated those issues. You know, your your boy, <laughs> Doctor Drew Rich. He's said many times most therapists are in therapy because right. it's it, it, you, you can't sit there and get dumped on all day and it not affect you. At least I don't think. Right. It, it also reminds me of Thirty Rock when. Uh, oh yeah, I was thinking about that too. What, what was, was it? Kenneth it was the Liz. Therapist? Liz was was telling what's his name the uh, it was Kenneth. Yeah, Kenneth, Kenneth the was page. listening to the, everyone's problems, and he couldn't handle it, <laughs> and so he had mm-hmm. to he had to tell all all of his problems to Jack, who put him in his mind vice, <laughs> and, and then Jack ended up breaking down. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. I mean, the human I mean, mind's pro- it's a fragile fucking thing, man. If you really think about it, like how many of us are like fucking. It, you know, Kenneth, this close, head one, can't contain all this. 
Yeah, I know, but I mean, just how many of us are probably a, a, a few bad things not going our way away from having a fucking mental breakdown? I mean, it's... And you Aaron, just, you never know, okay. I guess. So, and Aaron, when, yes. you know, when we were talking about it, and you're like, you would rather try to look at it from a... Philosophical you know, standpoint of... Yeah, you know, when, when you start talking about things like child molestation, it's so hard for so many people to... Yeah. I, I, yeah, you can't step outside the of the issue from. and the, the horrificness of the issue itself and talk about it in a almost detached way because people are going to look who aren't in that frame of mind. If they hear you talking in that frame of mind, they're going to be like, you're a fucking pedophile. Right. Only uh, a pedophile a could talk that calmly yeah, about right. that and not feel this fucking rage and anger. Right. How could you be a parent and not want to kill somebody? It's like, look, I'm a parent. I want to kill people every day. I'm a parent. I want to kill children every day. Not yeah. everyone should be breeding. Right. I mean, but, well, but just because I want to do something doesn't mean I do it. I can think philosophically about it as a concept, but also understand that once a person crosses that line and actually acts on it, I, they're beyond help at that point. It's, it's unfortunate, but it's too late for that person to be helped. Exactly, and I'm cold I'm hearted once that you they, cross the line. Right, I'm not saying that they shouldn't receive therapy or shouldn't strive to be a better person in jail while they wait for the electric chair, hopefully. But <laughs> I... See, to know, me, that's a waste That's a waste of a good test subject. See, we right. just need to isolate them. We just need to isolate them in their own facility and study them and pick them apart like they're fucking lab mice and try to well, figure no, out how like the this. New, right. the new, you start making the new super pigs. But there's nothing to be gained from dehumanizing somebody, regardless of what they did, either. Because you I'm not talking like I'm not talking test cosmetics and narco- and uh, <laughs> pharmaceuticals on them. I'm talking about look. Here's the deal: y- y- adamantium claws. You're never getting out of here. This is bottom line. This is your life. So you can either sit in a fucking cell 23 hours a day and get an hour to shower, shit, shave, and get exercise under guard. Or you can you can let us try to pick your brain apart, figure out why the way you are. And if you really want to fucking go for the full gusto, hey, we got plenty of isolated areas. We could set up areas to where it's a, a minimum security for for people who actually <laughs> go through with 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 the medical testing, and let them know there's a risk. But it's what you rather be in a, in a in a lockdown facility the rest of your life, or be able to get up and actually have some semblance. Of a little bit of freedom. Yeah. Oh, and, and if you kill yourself. Now take this pill that gives you a 12 hour erection. Right. And if Don't you take ki- this pill that castrates you. If you kill yourself, too, make sure you hang yourself because we want to study your brain. Well, and there's not, other, there's not many other choices unless you're looking to get like caught and set on fire or beaten to death yeah. in the head in the prison. So, I mean, I, look, once you cross that line, and to me, it would have to be like clear cut case or someone who's done it more than once. Not like we've talked about, like high school lovers, and one was overage, one was underage. Nothing, right. not that. But but it's it, people can't separate certain things like that, and that's why that's one more reason why, to not be so extreme on when it comes to the law on these things, because people will extrapolate and go, okay, well, this seventeen-year-old who fucked this fourteen-year-old should go to jail. No, he shouldn't go to jail. He goes to high school with the chick. Is it wrong? Yeah, probably. Are they scar? Is the girl scarred for life? No, not unless he was abusive to her. Should she be having sex at fourteen? I don't think so. But are you going to stop fourteen-year-olds from fucking? And how? And here's oh, where here's shit, where my son's turning fourteen. <laughs> <laughs> and here's and here's where here's where it gets here's where it gets really yeah. fun. Here's where it gets really fun. Okay, yes. <laughs> if you're trying to if you're trying to talk about it philosophically yes. and remove yourself from the emotional part of the issue, mm-hmm. the minute. A female starts menstruating, and a male starts shooting fucking loaded fucking shots. Isn't that it's nature on. saying? Isn't it? Isn't that nature saying? Basically, you're ready to reproduce. I mean, yeah. so just looking at it from a purely scientific point of view. Okay. And biology, in biology, your body is saying now is the time to start pursuing yeah. a mate. But. Uh, no, you it, go, eh, but you see, you're already, st- you're not thinking I, in the coldly scientific way. You, I you am, go, Rich. Eh. And, the sci- and the fact is, that argument can be ma- made for so much bad behavior that humans might want to do 
if they were purely id driven but we are in a situation where we are now in control of our evolution and we have to understand that there are there are uh in the evolution of us as a species there are many many things that have changed and just because nature or biology says hey you should do this you should do that you're ready for this doesn't necessarily make it the right time because our brains now develop differently than they did when we were just a, a pure animal species controlled by our environment we are I ask you this sir we are controlling our environment we are in charge of our evolution and that's mostly in the brain where that evolution I'm, is taking place even in I ask you this e- question yes do are we in charge of the of our evolution or do we think we are in charge of our evolution no we are in charge of our evolution because of our control over the environment we took control well, see, we can we took control of our evolution when we started making fires gathering in groups and 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 uh and uh and, and forming societies well see this is to me i can i can even argue against my own point by saying you know hundreds of years ago it was, I mean, it just in our culture, it wasn't shocking to see 14-year-old, 15-year-old girls getting married, starting families, but life expectancy wasn't as long. Right. So if we were going to continue as a species, they, it was out of necessity. Then I can even argue against that point and say, well, if we start, you know, without the help of medical science, our bodies start falling apart and... You know, we should be di- dead but by, by the time we're 40, 45. Then aren't we fucking with biology then? Aren't we, fu- aren't we basically shunning fucking That's our own biology of, and saying yes. we've, we're, we're, we're beating this? We got this? That's what I'm talking about. That's us taking control of our evolution, deciding. But this, I don't, I I don't told, I'm to totally agree with you. This is one subject I feel I could debate on either side of it and pretty much have a sound argument. Yeah, well, and, but the thing is, when you when you make when you try and make biology as uh, as an excuse for behavior, uh, then you're just saying that uh, basically that person or you yourself is choosing to devolve willingly and give into their base instincts. Yeah, that's exactly and, what you're saying, actually. Yeah. So how is I mean. All right, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I, dude, I'm hey, right man, there with some you. Some of us it's didn't a, make it out of the swamp. It's okay. I'm right there with you. It's it's the same conundrum I've had when I try to talk to people about Fight Club, especially uh-huh. young guys when they watch Fight Club for the first time and they're like pumped up. And I'm like, okay, the first half of that movie, I get it. It pumps you up. But that second half shows you what a horrible person Tyler Durden was. Right, right. Okay, and, and it, that should just make you go, oh, so that whole first half was the break you down, build you up part that the military does in basic training and boot camp so you don't hesitate at the moment when we need you to kill somebody. So you, seeing horrific things and committing horrific acts don't phase you at the moment like they would if we hadn't have done this to you. Right. You know, I mean, the first half of that movie is we've been told we're going to be rock stars and movie stars and we're not, and we're pissed off and we're doing something about it. And what fucking 20 early guys in his early twenties, most of you, your average guy can't go fuck you. Yeah, I can no. get behind that. Yeah. But they're not getting the bigger joke that I think was one of the, the bigger messages in the, in the book and in the movie, which was the fact that while Tyler Durden was preaching this freedom from oppression and this crazy society, he was a fucking tyrant. Yeah. And it, and he was a dictator and he wasn't benevolent. Right. And if he actually gained control of the world, mm, you wouldn't sounds be free. Familiar. You wouldn't be free at all. Hey, that, that sounds super familiar. Right, doesn't it? The things that are going on lately. <laughs> hmm. and, and I think also the part of the reason why the concept of Fight Club was used in that story was because it plays into that male thinking. And while I'm sure the Chuck Palahniuk thought that, well, some people just aren't going to get it and just see the glorified violence in this and get off on that. Maybe somebody else will, will actually think more deeply about it and say, well, geez, you know, 
I was so into the first half of this movie because all these cool fights and the blood and everything, and it was fucking cool. And you'd be like, yeah, I wish I could be in a fight club. And then you make that turn with the movie by the end and realize maybe it's not such a good idea, right? But not everybody makes that turn and goes with the movie. They only take what they what they want from it. Yeah. Uh, uh, Again, me, they, they, should, they want to take You should the, have a really sick feeling in your stomach by the end of that movie. Yeah. Well, right. If you like, have any kind of conscience, in my opinion. Right. I still say train spotting should be shown in high schools. You, oh, you want, hey, you want kids to not cool. do drugs? This is the greatest don't do drugs uh, public service announcement ever made. Uh, uh, train spotting came out my like junior year. I saw it like eight times in the theater. Guess who's never touched heroin ever? Yeah. <laughs> no, me too. Ever. Right. <laughs> it's Same here. It's been offered to me. Like, nope. I'm good. Oh. Oh wait! I'm straight. I take that back. I did snort it once, and if you've taken ecstasy in the '90s, you probably took some heroin. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, <laughs> well, there's a difference between willfully injecting or snorting. No, I know. And yeah. being told that you're given something because also, if you've taken ecstasy in the last 20 years, you've taken some form of meth. You, you've taken everything. Yes. <laughs> yes. So. I mean, that's just all there is to it. But no, it's, it wasn't train spotting for me. It was uh, his requiem for a dream. And the fact that oh, now, uh, when, yeah. when I was that's five, he died of a, of a hot shot. You mm-hmm. know? And so I, I knew from that age to stay away from it, but I didn't have a, a face to put with it of what it looked like until I saw that movie. And I was like, that's fucking horrifying. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. Requiem for a Dream was a nice bookend for me. It came out when I was, uh, I think, what, 2021. It was a, it was a nice little bookend to but, uh, honestly, remind me in my 20s, hey, you still don't want to do heroin. We're going to remind you again. I don't know. I, I, there's definitely similarities between the two movies. I still feel like Train Spotting is so much more effective because while while both of them used fantastic elements to exaggerate and deepen their stories, um, when it came to the actual drug abuse and the effects, I think that Train Spotting was much more concise about that. And whereas, it, okay, so let me see if I can explain this better. In Requiem for a Dream, you kind of went into a world and you stayed there, right? This whole little world of these heroin acts that they had created for themselves around them, right? And you could almost believe that, well, okay, but I'm not a heroin addict. So that could never happen to me. In train spotting, you see both sides. You see these fantastical elements the dream he has with the baby crawling on the ceiling, the way he sinks into the floor, um, you know. The, the surreality of, of, of certain elements of that. But then he flips it right back around. Uh, Danny Boyle does, the director, and shows you the cold, hard reality of it as well. And well, see, I, to, to me, when I think of, like, I think of Train Spotting and Renton coming down, and then I think of uh, Requiem, and I think of that ridiculous alien that was growing out of his arm, right? See, I, I, think, know, I, think, like, I think of I think of Requiem and I think of for the person who who goes, well, I have no desire to try heroin. I don't understand, you know. Then I still have no sympathy for him. They did this to themselves. Mm-hmm. That's that's what his mother was there for because her addiction started with the fact that oh yeah, one her husband had died, her son had moved out, she was codependent and had no one, so she became addicted to television and food. And her little sewing circle, and that's what those are. Well, you can make an argument they're mal- you know they're ben- they're malignant, but I mean ultimately for the most part they're benign for most people. But when the the allure of something more from her television being on the game show that she watched all the time, that's when her addiction kicked in because she went to the doctor and said, "I need to lose weight." And the doctor said, "This is an old woman who has no problems, has no history of addiction, doesn't even smoke. Here, take these pills." Right. You'll be good. That that was for more of the, the every person who goes, well, that shit can't happen to me because I'll never stick a needle or, or a straw up my nose. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but to counter and, that, and though... Trace, and train it, spotting used humor to lighten the mood. Dude, I, I've, oh, I've seen Requiem for a Dream one time. It, it, I was so disturbed after I saw that movie. That's it. 
Well, One time, I, I, good for me. I think that the humor in train spotting is what does make it more effective. And, you know, to counter, to counter your point, Rich, um, I think the, the fact that in Requiem, the, the person, the, the main character who is addicted to drugs, his mother turns out to be a drug addict as well. And again, somebody could say, oh, well, you know, drug addicts begat drug addicts. This is where he gets his behavior from and blah, blah, blah. Whereas train spotting. Yeah, but she was, became an addict well after he did. Like a, I know. a, a, a drug addict. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. But in, but in train spotting, it was pretty much everyone came from a normal home, right? As fucked up as their lives were. There was no talk in that story about any of the characters receiving any sort of abuse as a child that made them into this heroin addict thief. It was more of like, this shit can just happen to you. You fall in with the wrong group of people. You decide that, you know, they convince you to try the, try the wrong things. And this can happen to everyone. You don't have to have fucked up drug addict parents to become a drug addict. You don't have to be neglected as a child to hate yourself. Well, I think also... What does it say? The right girl, the right friends? That's all you need? Right. Yeah, exactly. I think, I think ultimately something that, that also plays a part into which one you're probably more partial to would be your uh, affection for the source material. And the writer who did it. Whereas I saw, um, okay, hold on a sec. You're gonna have to edit this out. I, I can't do this. With, I can't do. I can't do this with Earl fucking blowing up my fucking shit while we're trying to do this. So I'm gonna have to mute him. Hold on a sec. Okay. Because because if not, you're gonna be hearing my phone go off in the background because he just no, won't shut up. This conversation starts. The only motherfucker buy a puppy. I don't know what to tell you. All right. <clears throat> Anyways. I had seen um, last last exit to Brooklyn by Hubert Selby, who also wrote Re- Requiem for a Dream when mm-hmm. I was young, and I've never seen that. Yeah, and so I read the book after seeing the movie, and that's where I got into him and his in his work, and oh, okay. also Jim Carroll. I would saw the Basketball Diaries, started looking into Jim Carroll as much as I could, you know, in in high school and stuff. Yep. And and so I I guess my introduction to it was more of the New York street you know back in the day type thing and I think people who are most of my friends who are really in the train spotting I have more of the hipster culture does that make any sense sure I I don't I, I, okay and and it's not saying one's better than the other because they're ultimately you know they're two works of art coming from the same born out of the same ideas but they're set in two completely separate settings set in two completely separate settings boy right. department or redundancy department but yeah that's the only reason i think i fucking feel more drawn to train uh, uh requiem than i do train spotting right but i mean i feel the same way about uh the, you know basketball diaries over requiem or train spotting you know i see that movie and i'm like you know i gotta watch that movie and i've seen requiem I'm not even joking. Probably over a hundred times. Oh, really? Jeez, I've seen it a few. Uh, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. I, I've shown it to so many people, and and at certain times in my life when I was getting a little crazy with whatever I was getting crazy with, I'd put it on and go, "Really? You really want to go down this road? <laughs> <laughs> Let me show you how bad it can get." Like it was almost like I stepped outside myself, put it in the fucking VCR DVD player. Hit play and was like, "Now sit down and watch this." Right. So <laughs> you, pop, you pop in the tape and they're like. How come the tape gets all warbly at the ass to ass scene? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know what? And, and as much as do that, <laughs> as much as I love, as much as I love Jennifer Conley. Yeah, oh yeah. The honest to God truth is, the first time I saw that scene, I was sick to my stomach. Yes, I it was. Hurt, yeah, yes. same here. It hurt me to see her do that because it yes. was when I my first my first real Hollywood crush was Jennifer Conley in Labyrinth, and then I saw Career Opportunities, and that cemented it. And then I saw it. Then I saw <laughs> the, the hot one? spot. Wait, Career Opportunities? Is that the one where they locked in the store? Locked in at Target, yeah. and she's riding the horse. <laughs> yeah. Dana Carvey in that. Yeah, yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> um, he might be. Uh, and then I saw a couple other movies that she was, was in uh, during the nineties. Oh, what the fuck is that? that actor? Frank name? Wally. Frank, Frank yeah, Wally. Frank Whaley. Yes, he is so awesome. Um, then I saw, then I saw, 
inventing the Abbots, which has the best. Oh yeah, I remember that breast movie. scene in in my opinion of of her for in, in, and so I mean I was just like completely. I sh- you know I've I've never met her, but if I met her, I'd be I'd be tongue tied, and I'm never really tongue tied. I've never been starstruck, but like that's how I was. So I, when I heard she was in that movie, I was like, that's not, I haven't read that book. Let me go into the movie without re- requiem without reading that book, and I did. And when it got to that scene, I was just like, oh. And my girlfriend at the time was like, that's your girl. This should this should be like some shit you're into, and I'm like, mm-hmm. I don't want to see her doing that. Right. Like if she Have wanted watching to do this it, movie, I'm like, if she wanted to do it, I'd be into it. But she's only doing it because homeboy's got a bag for her at the end of it. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like that's. Well, I yeah. don't want to. Mm, I don't want to see that shit. But if you just stumbled across that scene on Mr. Skin, it'd be no problem. It oh, it have been. It was on, seeing bro. everything that was leading <laughs> up to that Dude. scene that made it gut wrenching instead of arousing. Apparently, she just did a movie where some guy, she's blowing some guy, and he pulls out, and he comes on her face, and they show it. And I had no idea about this movie. And I I had to look it up. And the premise of the movie is she's a homeless chick who's lost everything. She's living on the street. Yeah. And that's what she has to resort to. And I'm like... I'm like, you know, for a second I was like, God, this is some, this is some uh, brown bunny type shit. I can get down with this. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. Like, I could, I could, <laughs> like, you know, but no, I can't now. So Yeah, the blood rushed in and then rushed out of my penis after <laughs> right you gave the, the description. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. oh, no, it did, that'll be it did, sad. It got no to crying the tip. while masturbating. It got to the tip and did a Michigan left. You know, it's just yeah. like whoop, hit turn around. All right, <laughs> back this way, guys. <laughs> made a U-turn back in the, inside. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> but I mean, it's just like uh uh you said yourself, you had read A Clockwork Orange. Most oh, people haven't read that now. One of my favorites. And they see the movie, and I think a lot of younger guys who see that movie get the point of that movie is lost on them. Right. Because they just see my drugs and you know this and a little bit of you know taste of the ultraviolence mm-hmm. and you know the the anti-hero thing, and it's the, the, it, the ultimate point of that that movie and of that story is just whoosh, over their head. So, you know, it's as much as I as much as I love film, and I can sit and talk about it until like we're all fucking. I'm, I'll be interested, and you guys will be crying from boredom. It's the danger of film versus reading something. At least to me, if you read something, you go, oh, okay. There's yeah. really. That's interesting because I watched Stanley Kubrick's uh, Clockwork Orange after I read the book probably at least two or three times. Mm. And it had been out, but I don't know. I was just, I didn't, I didn't go through a, a real movie, arty movie phase until uh, my later years in high school. Beginning years of high school was all books. And, you know, I mean, I under ooh. I already I was w- very familiar with the the source material. Did, obviously, did you and, owe him? <laughs> I did. Yes, he did. did yeah. you, I heard it. Heard it. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, sorry. Yeah. So I guess uh, I don't have a clear separation of how effective the message is in the in the movie as opposed to the book. I mean, you know what I'm saying. Like, ultimately, what, what I think it'd be hard to come. I, mean, I know up, it would be hard to come away say, from reading. What would you the say book. is the message of the book? Ultimately, oh geez, um, I, I guess if you just break it down to its most core concept, it's that uh, your your actions have consequences. And see, now I took away from not the book but the movie. I took away you can't fix fucked up. Did it? Did it go over my head? See, okay, I from the movie. I've never read the book. Mm-hmm. The movie, I'm on more along the lines of Chris. It was, is it good to have correct societal behavior because you're forced to, or is right. it better to just to, or because you know someone well, imposed that upon you, well, and so you're yeah, 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 you're forced to. This go, this point is right out of you. The last scene, you pretty. I, I just gleaned from it is like, fucked up. Alex is always going to be in there. Like that's to me. That's what I drew from. Like that, that's the conclusion I drew. Is like he's there now. He's dormant. You 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 you, you stamped him down. Right. But he's he's always going to be there. But to uh, 
to go back to our earlier conversation of, about uh, about evolution, I mean, this is the, the characters in A Clockwork Orange were characters who chose not to stay evolved, who chose to give in to base instincts. Hey, it's just nature. It's it's nature. It, it's built into us to be violent and to want to fuck anyone that we can get our hands on. And Wow, I didn't think about that. That whole movie shits on the whole nurture concept. Wow, 37 years old. Just kind of realized that. Hmm. Well, no, I've always thought that. I remember in psychology well, no, no, no. class, it, and nature, I, and nurture, nature and nurture come up, and I go, I think we're born fucking selfish in what we would consider evil, because if you look at children, children are the cruelest things in the world to each other. Mm-hmm. And if you look at babies... Babies are, are, they don't, the only thing is there's, there's not conscious thought leading to, if I do this long enough, I'll get my way. They just cry until you feed them. They don't understand that you're annoying the shit out of them until they get what they want. But ultimately, that's what it is. And if yeah, babies if, are little assholes. And if, and if children aren't taught, once they're out of that, that infant stage, as they go into the toddler stage, that you sometimes you, what's your wants aren't going to be instantly gratified and then you mm-hmm. see those kids on the playground with other kids for the first time at four or five years old those children are pure it they want what they want and they they don't they, they violence is not that big of a deal they'll smack the shit out of another kid and take a toy from them right well yeah but as a species we grew up in a very cruel world we had to fight for everything that we we uh needed you know, we had to protect ourselves even from the environment, much less uh, other animals and plant life. But once our brains evolved to a certain point, we decided as a species that we didn't want that, that there could be something better. Well, that goes and back the people to the- who give into their base instincts and try and say, well, you know, it's, it's biology for a man to spread his seed. So... That's why that that that's justification for my behavior is somebody who is going against that societal pact that we've made with each other that we all want to live in a world where ultimately we can feel safe and feel free to do the things that we want to do. I would go so far as to say a person who feels that way isn't even worried about going against society. They're just acting on their base instinct well, of I want to dominate so the most important thing to dominate is to make sure this, that my genes survive. Mm-hmm. They don't care about what's right or wrong. But, uh, That's the thing. They're amoral. Well, they're just going on what they what what is what makes sense. It's it's just like when you see animals and you have you know an animal that dominates other animals. It's not like I'm going to subjugate you because you're a different color. It's, no, I am the stronger one, I am the bigger one, and you're going to fucking bow to me or I'm going to kill you. Right, but that is all of us. somebody when they say something you don't agree with? Like that kind of attitude? But this is is all of us, right? This is, we understand that this is built into all of us. Uh, There are certain people, there are types of people who don't ultimately grow up, but, you know, I was that person. As a young man, I thought, sex is just sex. And I'm not saying that I was like predatory about it or like, you know, uh, aggressive, but I also didn't see consequences for the people that I chose to have sex with. And I had to, I had to grow up and evolve a little bit, bit myself and understand that, that all I was doing was giving into base desires that were affecting other people affecting my friendships, affecting my life and my own emotional uh, growth. And that's where I feel that things like empathy and compassion aren't natural feelings for most people. They have to be taught that, whether it's through You're right. someone, te- someone teaching them right from wrong or the first time they beat a kid for his toy and they see the pain they've caused they something in them on some base level goes wait a minute right no look a, at everybody else it's, it's look very, at me i'm not acting like everybody else this isn't right i just caused this person pain more pain than i was in when i wanted their toy because that's all i did i wasn't bleeding and crying mm-hmm. 
Right. I mean, as, a, as a species, we are born with the capacity for empathy. We are not born with empathy. We have to be shown how to use our capacity for empathy. Mm-hmm. I agree with that. Getting back to what we were talking about, people being wired for certain things, mm-hmm. I think there's just some people who are natural born sociopaths okay. who just, they do, no matter what you try to teach them, no matter what you try to show them, no, no matter what, they can't feel empathy for other people. They don't understand yeah. it. It's, it's like it goes along with the, they fake emotions because they don't have them, but they also don't have the same fight or flight response which is really three, flight, fight, and freeze, but that's beside the point. It's another discussion. They don't have any of those responses, so they don't mind being in hyper-dangerous situations, Mm -hmm. but they don't get the rush from it like we would, like jumping out of an airplane. They just go, it's something I'm going to do. But These are are separate types of people in my mind because we're talking about, on one hand, somebody with a healthy brain who is too lazy to use it properly and versus somebody with an unhealthy brain. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, definitely. And that's, isn't that the difference between a sociopath and a psychopath? I know that, I know that in, in some schools of thought and psychology, they're, they're interchangeable, like, yeah, but, or one's, one's more acceptable thing to say today versus it was 40 years ago, like manic depressive versus bipolar. But really, a psychopath knows right from wrong, just doesn't care. A sociopath, a true sociopath, just runs on, like we've been saying, pure id. Right. I want what I want, and they learn to fake right. being a, among the sheep to get what they want. It's the difference between ignoring your capacity for empathy oh, and, and Something not, else that sounds familiar. It, it, it's a difference between ignoring your capacity for empathy and not having a capacity for empathy. Right? Yeah, I told, right? I'm totally psych- on board with that. Yeah, the psychopath is born with the capacity for empathy, but wasn't nurtured correctly, or whatever it may be. That for, for whatever reason it. has convinced himself, him or herself, that. But I don't want to waste my time doing the right thing because it's so much easier to do it this way. Right, or they're the only person that really matters. Uh, yeah, exactly. They've convinced themselves, whereas a, a uh, sociopath just lacks that empathy. And it doesn't, you know, it, by that definition, a sociopath doesn't have to be a violent or horrible person. A sociopath could still learn to adapt and go, well, I understand that when I act this way, nobody wants to be around me and my life is miserable. I, well, that's, it's almost that's, like being autistic. Like it, it, when they talk about the spectrum, there's certain people who suffer from autism who just seem completely shut off from the world. And there's others that learn to adapt and say, well, I don't feel anything when this person smiles at me, but I also do recognize this as a certain signal that I should in, interpret it a certain way in order to be able to talk to somebody and, and you know, you know, it, it, they might only hear words. They don't pick up on on facial expressions and subliminal ways where we, that we uh, uh, that uh, that other people would. But they Ooh, learn yeah. they learn to read those and go, "Oh, okay. Well, I know that when somebody tends to do this type of tick or moves their head in this motion, that this means that." And they can almost interpret it. But it's but it, it it's like they're speaking a different language. Definitely, and if you've ever had any experience with someone who's high-functioning autistic, or I guess it'd be considered Asperger's at this point, um, you've seen it, and you've seen it firsthand. You know how hard it is for them. Right. And then there's people that I, you know, I've had, <laughs> I've had, you know, people who go, I, you know, I think my child is autistic, and I'm like, look, I have a cousin who's autistic, and. Unless this is this child is so much higher in the spectrum than my very high functioning cousin is, they're they're not autistic. They're just an asshole. Right. Yeah. There's well, a difference. You know, there is a difference. Yeah. And, well, we are a lot of people. I think like to classify all behavior problems as some sort of spectrum of autism, especially because it tends to remove some personal responsibility from what is happening. Well, it's not my fault my kid's growing up to be an asshole. I'm just giving him everything that he wants and telling them that he's better than everybody else and a special 
person. Exactly. But and I, but you know, but growing he, up, he must be autistic because he's turned out to be an asshole. <laughs> growing up, I had a friend whose older brother, um, I don't know the specifics of it, but basically, he went to prison for child molestation. And it was. Man, we just can't get time. away from the subject, can we? It was. Well, no, no. It, it's going back to what you said. It's just, it's the only thing I have to pull from my own experience where I, I, I was like, look, you know, if you want to just look at it from a cold scientific point of view, you know, more and more we're finding that these people, for lack of a better term, just aren't wired the same. And, he, and the first words out of his mouth was, oh, so you're saying it's not his fault? And I said, no, I'm not. I said, why do you take such a simplistic view of something so complicated that I just told you? Mm-hmm. Is it because you're, you're too fucking ignorant to understand? Or, or are, you, are, you just, are you just pissed off and you're hurt? And, you know, he, he kind of looked at me and he's like, I don't want to talk about it no more. Right. And a couple of years down the road, we talked about it and he goes, I get what you were saying now. And I get how come you were so quick to jump down my throat because I wanted the quick microwave answer. I wanted the, I press 30 seconds, and in 30 seconds, my food is warm answer. And it's not how the subjects like these work. Now, granted, this was after him going to college for years and, you know, being exposed to a world that he had never been exposed to before and, and to ideas and thoughts he had never even, it never even occurred to him on his own. So he had a little bit more of a, of a pool to pull, or a bigger pool, way bigger pool to pull from. Right. But I was like... So do you understand why I, because he's, I'm like, you're not dumb. So don't act dumb and take what I'm saying is it's not his fault. All right. That's, that's it, in no point did I say any of that. You know, it, we, we, we are so quick in the, in the, in the victimhood culture, or as I would rather call it the victimhood Olympics that we, that, that our culture is in now, we all want to get the gold. And we're so quick to, it's not my fault, it's not my fault, it's not my fault. Well, the problem is, okay, look, no one was, very few people are dealt a royal flush sitting at the poker table of life. Or very few people are dealt blackjack. There we go. Be- better example. Okay, uh, sitting at the, at, the, at the blackjack table of life. So you got to play the hand you're dealt. But that doesn't mean if you cheat that you're not an asshole for cheating. Okay, look, y- y- yeah, you didn't get dealt 21 right off the bat, but if you're dealt, you know, 14 and you hit and you bust, you, you, you know, you take that loss and you, you you man up for another hand. Yeah. Well, you know, this to tie this conversation in with what's going on currently, and yes, we have made it uh, almost two hours now into the show without talking directly about Trump, but I'm about to. Um, when you, you said know, it first. When, when when people talk about what they admire in him, there's a lot of this like, you know, he there's a lot of discussion about the gut, right? And that we're in this mentality, at least part of this nation, is that that's where all the best thoughts come from, apparently. Not the head, but the gut. And Some of my really, worst ideas have come from my gut. Yes. And, and to me, all I hear is base instinct. Do, your gut tells you something. Okay, if your gut tells you don't go down that alley because that person kind of looks shady, listen to your gut, right? <laughs> but let's say, okay, l- let, me, l- let me actually modify that. Your gut tells you there's a dark alley. You see a, an African-American gentleman at the end of it, and he looks shady. And your gut tells you, hey, don't go down there. Hey, Probably a good bet not to. Not saying that all black people are going to attack you, but in this situation, your gut's probably a good thing to listen to. But and, if, okay. But and if you're in, if but, you're in Detroit, it's good advice. But if you're in Biloxi, Mississippi, and you're a black guy, and you see a guy with shaved head and red suspenders and right. Doc Martens on, it's probably a good idea not to go down that alley. No, no, no. But but hear me out though, because there's a, there, there's a reason why I made the guy at the end of the alley black. Because so you gotcha. trust you trust your instinct on not going down the alley where the black guy was, but then you also trust your instinct when you see every other black male of the same age, right? And that in those situations, that's where your brain should turn on and go, just because this guy resembles that guy that was in the alley doesn't mean that he wants to attack me. 
So it, it's relying on your base instincts in ways that uh, you're really overcoming your more powerful brain. And to say that that these people like this leader who leads, he makes decisions with his gut, you know, and that's that's a good thing. Well, why is that a good thing? I mean, these are where some of his more horrible concepts come from. His gut tells him Muslims are bad, and Muslims are bad. You know, it, yeah. I no, know. I mean, I had a I had a buddy that had a a tattoo of the transcendent order, and he said it meant action without thought is the purest form of action. And I always thought that no. is the dumbest shit I ever heard. You just pretty much said you want to make every decision in your life based on not thinking at all. R- right. I don't know. I get. I know there's some deeper philosophical meaning to it, but still, like. And that's just how I'm wired, I guess. No, I, I hear you. I mean, if it, n- and neither you can't say that that you can completely ignore your biology or your base instincts, any and and just be a purely cerebral person. You know, you you have to have both. It's understanding what part they play in your life. There's you a know? difference between someone who runs on gut instinct and someone who thinks a thing through. Perfect example is the it's it's the last episode in the in the last episode of Mash they did it. It's a, it was a it was a uh, I don't know psychological whatever I don't know if it could be considered a test, but they used to throw it out there. Okay, mm-hmm. when the last episode of Mash they put it into real real practice. You know, Hawkeye is with people. He's trying to save them. They're hiding from the enemy soldiers. Someone has a newborn baby. The oh, baby's that was, crying. That was the last episode. God, I yeah. remember that episode so much. And he said, and so, and he either he said or someone else said, "Shut that baby up." I and be- I believe he did. And the and the mother killed the baby. Stifles the cries with her hand and ends up suffocating the baby in the order baby. to stop this whole bus full of people from being found by other people who would just execute them on sight, the exactly. whole group. Now, there's two types of people who would say that. Someone who's talking from their gut, right. who's probably more worried about saving their own ass, and I guess you could argue being pragmatic, shut that baby up. And then there's other people who just, as quick as they can, think through the situation, okay, if we don't shut this baby up, we're all going to die. And sometimes, yeah. sometimes you have to sacrifice the one for the betterment of the many, right? As in, so the shut that baby up. The baby's Who going to it, the baby's going to die no matter what. Yes, right. So it's it, and it, that's someone who thought it through versus someone who thinks from their gut. They might, and all the only reason I'm using this as an example is because I think the nuance of that situation is lost in a lot of people this day, these days because they go, well, they both came to the same conclusion. Yes, but one put thought into it, and the other was just trying to save their own ass because that was their gut instinct. Right. So. Just because you you can take two completely different roads and get to the same conclusion, that doesn't justify the way you got to it. Because that would be the argument someone who's going, well, what if I just act from my gut? I saved us all. The kid should, the kid 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 didn't get us killed, right? That's what my gut told me to do. Yeah, but what about the person who spent three seconds thinking through the situation and did the same thing? I'd rather have someone who contemplates the consequences of their actions before taking that action than someone who just goes, I'm going to go with the first thing that pops to my head. Right. But it's not about ignoring your gut. You know, a, a competent person will usually have a gut feeling on something and then analyze that gut feeling. Okay, where is this gut feeling taking me? What are the consequences from from acting on my gut decision? Are they positive or negative? Right. So it's not about com- ignoring, ignoring your gut. It's about taking input from all sources and coming up with a healthy decision. First time I got cheated on in a relationship, and I caught the chick, and she crying, and, oh, forgive me, and it'll never happen again, take me back, and I did, and it happened again. As I was taking her back, my gut was screaming at me, what the fuck are you doing? Right. And no one sat me, no one, because I was so ashamed I'd been cheated on. Because somehow in my mind, I equated that with I'm not man enough to keep my bitch in line. Right. Which is f- insane that we're taught because that's, <laughs> what are you going to do? Beat the bitch until she fucking tells, so she's afraid to, you know, 
look at another man? Am I going to go the Ike Turner route? No, I'm not. You know, but for some reason, I equated that to that. So I, I didn't talk to anybody about it, and I made this decision completely isolated and on my own and against my gut instinct. The next time I ran in that situation, I talked to people, and they were like, what's your gut telling you not mm-hmm. to do it? Why? Because right. the odds are greater. She's, she's got away with it one time. She's going to try it again at some point in the future. That's what my gut's telling me. I'm not saying it's a, it's a certainty. I'm saying... The odds are greater that she's going to try to do it again and get away with it. You know, the whole Bush fucking up the the quote, you know, burn me once, shame on you, burn me twice, shame on me. There won't be a third time. That's how the quote goes. So I'm I'm totally with you on that. (laughs) You know, situations, yes. Sometimes it's better to listen to your gut. The problem is if you're a, if you're a person who, who thinks and tends to overthink, you can think yourself out of your, you can think your gut instinct into the ground. Right. Which is just as bad as acting without thought. My gut tells me when I get money, spend that shit on shit that you want. (laughs) That's what my gut tells me. Every time my wallet's full, my gut's like, what can you buy? And I have to go, my brain has to go, shut the fuck up, gut. Oh, yeah, for sure. I hear you there. Like, and I've cash in my wallet. It's like it's, you know, what's the, it's like it's dipped in a communicable disease. I have to get rid of this cash. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, I, I mean it, it, the best way to learn not to spend cash is to have cash and discipline yourself not to blow it. Dude, because you I'm got it. wired the complete opposite. Trust me, I had friends. Like, guy I used to live with, you talk about, you know, I'll cash my check, I put 200 bucks in my wallet, and that's all I got till next payday, and that's how I learned to do it. I'm not like that. To me, if cash is in my wallet, it's, I'm like Oprah. You get some cash, and you get some ca-. Like, I'm the guy that the debit card was made for. Right. Like, to me, it is like, this is all you get right now. You get what you need for this purchase. Now, my buddy, who puts the cash in his wallet, he's the, he's the opposite. He's like, I just look at that as free money. Like what? All right, it's cool. Swipe it. Here we go. Right. Like it's it's just, it's just funny how brains are wired. It's just funny how we're we, we can have the complete inverse. Right. You're thinking happen. of it like I've got this pool of money, and that's what I want as a pool of money. Ultimately, I want the security of having the savings and to have this money to draw for the no, things like that a, I need. Like and a swimming pool, like Scrooge McDuck, would also be cool. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> But once you remove the money from that pool and it goes into your wallet, it's fair game. But other, oh, yeah. but, but other people have the, the intangible of, I can understand the money in my wallet, but when it's this virtual money on the card, it doesn't even really exist. Yeah. It, it, oh, yeah. So I'm sure there's a, there's a religion correlation in there somewhere with some people, I guess. <laughs> Well, like, I think I that's one it. subject. We'll it doesn't exist for to me if time. I don't see it. Right. <laughs> so, 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 was my early Catholicism made me better with money? <laughs> it's given me faith in my checking account. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I think that. Uh, man, I'm glad that I really brought up atheists. That, that I just really need them to cash in my wallet. <laughs> We have come completely well, it, full circle once again. If I can't touch it, if it's in the bank, then it ain't real. So if it's in yeah. my wallet, it's real. So Yeah. <laughs> well, bef- before, we, uh, before we get off here, mm-hmm. um, I did really want to touch on uh, something Chris sent us in the, in the group chat and oh, something, I had posted, something I had posted a few days before. Oh, yeah. Uh, Bill Maher's new rules. He's back. Yeah. And pissed. I was telling Rich the other day while we were chatting before Sporgy, like when I watch political, or, wow, that's old I am. Uh, real time, <laughs> you know. I gotta, you know, I like to think I'm a centrist, and I'm rolling my eyes a lot when I watch real time. But but what he did last week, I mean, I was in the car by myself driving up to Tacoma, like cheering, like yeah, motherfucker, like that's why I still watch you. Like, because you say shit like this, and it makes up for all the dumb shit that I disagree with you with. <laughs> right. 
Like, uh, I think he made an outstanding, like, uh, first of all, I, all I heard was Rich when he was talking. So good job to you, Rich. Like, all I heard out come out of his mouth was shit Rich has said. But I mean, oh, it was, oh, it's cool. It, HBO actually has just the new rule up, so we can hear it real quick if you yes. want, or at least a little bit of it. It's like five minutes because it's, it's it's dude. Play the whole thing, man. It's it, it needs to be out there. <laughs> and finally, new rule: while the sting of defeat is still fresh, and the horrors resulting from that defeat pile up, liberals must examine all the reasons why we keep losing elections. Starting with Democrats have gone from the party that protects people to the party that protects feelings. From ask not what your country can do for you to you owe me an apology. <laughs> Republicans have... That one person starting to applaud. Democrats They're like, oh, wait, he's talking shit about us. Can't we find <laughs> yeah. a balance? You know, in 2016, conservatives won the White House, both houses of Congress, and almost two-thirds of governorships and state legislatures. Whereas liberals, on the other hand, caught Steve Martin calling Carrie Fisher beautiful in a tweet and made him take it down. I'm not making that up. That really happened. Here's Steve's offensive tweet. When I was a young man, Carrie Fisher was the most beautiful creature I'd ever seen. She turned out to be witty and bright as well. <gasps> How could you, Steve? <laughs> we thought we knew you monster. this. You noted her appearance first. And then that she was witty and bright. You're a monster. <laughs> <laughs> Liberals do this all the time. They get offended for people who themselves would not be offended. You know that whole controversy about the name Washington Redskins? They did a survey. Nine out of ten actual Indians don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> we brought that up on Sporgy. Mm -hmm. No, it's the true. Way. Their, in their ancestors learned firsthand that New England Patriots cheat. <laughs> but that doesn't stop celebrities from groveling when they get caught playing dress up on Halloween. Here's Hillary Duff last year. Ah! We're in a pilgrim. Of course, her tweet. I'm so uh, sorry to costume. people I offended. It was not properly thought through, and I am truly from the bottom of my heart. Sorry! Ah! Chris Hemsworth was even more beside himself with self-loathing after as he attended Indian. a Lone Ranger-themed party dressed as an Indian. <gasps> he wrote, I was stupidly unaware of the offense. I sincerely and unreservedly apologize to all First Nations people for this thoughtless action. I hope that in highlighting my own ignorance, I can help in some small way. Oh, for fuck's sake, you're Thor. Grow a pair. <laughs> 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 you didn't offend Indians any more than you offend gays when you wear a cape and hammer, guys. <laughs> it was a Lone Ranger themed party. You could only be a cowboy, Indian, or a horse. <laughs> Just like if you live in Wyoming. <laughs> I don't get that one. Last year, Justin Timberlake tweeted that the an least African populated state Jesse Williams in the Union. inspired okay. him and again had to apologize for the sin of giving someone a compliment. I apologize to anyone that felt that was out of turn. I have nothing but love for all of you and all of us. <laughs> oh, good, good, because life knows no sin greater than the one he was accused of doing, which was cultural appropriation cultural appropriation. That's the idea that white people shouldn't adopt things from other ethnic groups. How dare you mix and match cultures to produce something new? Where do you think you are? Some kind of melting pot? That's a great fucking point. Yeah. <laughs> you know, everyone should get along, but Americans stay in your lane. Actually with the Democrats on the issues Raising minimum wage, sensible gun laws, path to citizenship, abortion rights, pro-environment, you name it. But we keep losing. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that. But the one we can immediately fix is that too often Democrats remind people of a man who has taken his balls out and put them in his wife's purse. <laughs> and please, someone tweet me right now and tell me how that was somehow inappropriate so I can tell you to go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
At the Golden Globes this month, Michael Keaton mixed up the titles of two movies that had a black cast, Hidden Figures and Fences, and said, Hidden Fences, <laughs> because he's a Klansman. <laughs> cue the outrage, cue the retraction. I screwed up. It makes me feel so badly that people feel badly. <laughs> If someone feels badly, that's all that matters. No, that's not all that matters. In fact, things like this don't matter at all. What matters is that while you self-involved fools were policing the language at the Kids' Choice Awards, a madman talked his way into the White House. That's the comment that had me shouting out loud in the car. What matters what are they is that all liberals for, by the were in a contest to see who could be the first to call out fat shaming. The Tea Party has been busy taking over school boards. Stop protecting your virgin ears and start noticing you're getting fucked in the ass. Okay. Yeah, buddy. Yeah. Couldn't have said it better it's good, it's good to know the only difference between Bill Maher and I on that subject is that he has a much larger fucking audience to preach it to. Right. <laughs> It, it, it lets it lets us know as a as a podcast we're not insane. We are not slowly going crazy. Right. No, and well, this, if you remember to his last episode of last season, the one that went right after the uh, it was the it was the next Friday after the election. Right. He said when I've been saying since the night we did our live election episode, I said this: if Trump wins. The fee, a lot of the blame lays at the feet of the people who've been the, the PC thought slash language police on the ultra left, the regressive left, let's call them what they are. And I've mentioned it before, the horseshoe theory, they're, 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 they're so far away from the middle, they're almost all the way back around to the, to, to the extreme right. right. And that's one of the things that, we need Bill Maher is unabashedly a liberal, and why I roll my eyes at, 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 at a lot of stuff he says. Probably not as much as Chris. He's the type of liberal that I guess I am. Who's like, look, I'm liberal. I'm not brain dead. I'm not. I'm not for using fascist tactics to get my way. That's not how you convince people to do shit. And I think a lot of the, where this is coming from with him is because he's a comedian, and comedians for the longest time, were the last people who had carte blanche to tell the truth in this world. And it's slowly being taken away. And it's being taken away by the so-called far, the, 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 the progressive left. The right doesn't even, the right fought their, their war with comedians in the 80s with Sam Kennison and, and Andrew Dice Clay and lost. Okay, they've given up that fight. It's like, it's like warning labels on, on records for, for people saying fuck. They've given up that fight. They've moved on. Okay, now the left is fighting a battle that we decided fucking three decades ago. And this shit, if, if you listen to us and you're a liberal and you're going, you know, I don't agree with everything you guys say, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, why do you have to tell a joke that, you know, might use the word fag or, you know, might goof on a gay guy or, or goof on a transgendered person? Comedy is when you say things you don't mean to either shock a laugh out of people, to be so far out there it's satire, or it's simply to get a laugh. That's it. Yeah, I heard uh, Matt Besser uh, talked about, uh, he's one of the guys that founded UCB. I heard him on some podcast. He said the whole point of comedy is absurdity. Right. Yeah. I mean, look, look at Sarah Silverman's uh, comedy. She she plays this character on stage who is ridiculous. And again, there's some people who don't understand it, who think that she actually is racist or something because she makes a joke about, you know, uh, Chinese people or something, or Chinese men in particular. But they, they don't she, understand the character that she's playing. Like, the joke is, isn't it ridiculous that I'm saying these things? And... If you think that's ridiculous, what's even more ridiculous is there are people out there saying them with a straight face. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with Andrew Dice Clay and Lisa Lampanelli. Those are characters. Right. Th those people do not walk through their everyday life acting that way. Right. <laughs> Lisa Lampanelli doesn't try and grab every black dick she sees. 
Exactly. It, it, Aaron, what's Corolla say all the time? It's about what's in your heart. Yeah. It, as far as far as when you say things like that, you know, it's well, also, say, never been a, never been a better time to be a real racist as well. Right. Well, when we talk <laughs> about being accused, when we talk about all this outrage that people are experiencing and demanding apologies and all that, you know, when you're talking about Adam Carolla. What it makes me think of is actually Dr. Drew, because usually on their show, they're talking about how, oh, Dr. Drew will say, everyone's upset at me over this issue. And he's like, shut the fuck up. You got two tweets. Like, seriously, we're letting this minority of the population that is outraged and is very vocal about it online seem to represent the rest of us because everybody else is too afraid to say, shut the fuck up, because then they're going to be labeled uh, a racist or a bigot or uh, homophobic or, you know, but to the media's play, the media is part of that. It, it is my opinion, it, even so, more so lately. They're they're they're, they're the, uh, the the Pied Piper, if you will, in front of the fucking mice. It just I seems know. lately. I, I don't know if I agree with that sentiment. I I I'm not saying that the media is not culpable, but I think in this instance they're more following the lead than they are leading the charge. I, I recently They're watched just a documentary. looking for where the story is and what people are talking about. I recently watched a documentary about Stevie Ray Vaughan, and in 82, his manager set them up to go to uh, Monterey and play the, the Blues and Jazz Festival. And that, that crowd, at that point in time, was used to very much more of a folk blues, you know, acoustic guitars, et cetera, et cetera. And they got up, and Stevie Ray Vaughan got up, and he did what he did. This was a huge crowd. And one of the things that his drummer was talking about is after the first song, people in the crowd started booing. And he said it sounded like everyone was booing. And the truth was, it was about half the crowd. The other half was cheering and clapping. But the boos were louder. Yeah. And so they, they played their set, and they figured they bombed. It was a waste of time and money to go over there. They're going to go back to Austin and fucking keep playing bars and die penniless. You know who was in that crowd who loved what they heard? David Bowie. Mick Jagger and Nile Rodgers. Damn. David Bowie and Nile Rodgers were working on Let's Dance at the time. He loved them so much that he got him to play on Let's Dance, put him on as the opening act for that tour, and Mick Jagger liked him so much. Anytime the Stones played a private party in Dallas, he hired Stevie Ray Vaughan and his band to be the band for the party. So right there, it, it, perspective is lost. When the media goes and people are outraged, Something I heard the other day on, on the radio made a lot of sense to me. A guy played an anchor saying that about something. It was, it was about a, a sports issue. And, you know, this, this sports anchor goes, and people were outraged. And he, he, he hit pause, and he goes, who are these fucking people? And he looked at his co-host, and he goes, are you outraged? No. Are you outraged? No. I'm not outraged. Anybody, please call in and tell me if you're outraged. And for the next hour, they took calls, and that one person called in. And was outraged. Right. The thing is, is that you see, just like you said about Dr. Drew, Dr. Drew gets on the radio or gets on TV and says what he says. And let's say 10% of the people that were listening who are on Twitter respond to him. And 3% of those that respond to him is negative. He focuses on a negative. Well, people are upset. Right. Who are these people? There's a handful of people. Most people don't give a fuck enough to tweet you about it. And even if they agree with you or disagree with you, it's not that big of a deal. Right. It's not, it, they're not so socially inept their entire life is ruined because you said something they disagree with. Mm -hmm. So they have to tweet at you personally. You're an asshole. But, but, I've but never tweeted such, a doctor. Yeah, but we use such dramatic and over-the-top language because we, want to ex we don't know how else to express outrage. So we're like, you're a horrible person. You should burn in hell. You should die. Well, that's, that's the other thing. It's... It, it, with internet culture has came the keyboard warrior and the 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 bulletproof glass of the, of your computer screen mm -hmm. and people use them and and anonymity to go along with it all and people use it as a weapon these are chicken shits for the most part granted i've met a few people who talk shit online and if you ran into them in life they'd talk shit to your face but they're very few and far between and we forget this you know, I was just listening to Bill Murray in an interview, and I asked him about, what do you feel about bad reviews? And he goes, I'm not going to lie to you. 
And anyone that tells you bad reviews, they bother me. Anyone that tells you they don't is lying. The only way to avoid it is to not read reviews. But sometimes you can't help but stumble upon one. And when you see one, if it's if it's you have to you have to look at it and you have to go, okay, is it a criticism that I feel is legit? That makes me feel worse than if it's a criticism that's I hate Bill Murray, he sucks, he's never been funny. I hope he gets fucked in the ass by an you know uh, uh, a gorilla with late stage AIDS. Right. Well, okay. Well, there, I was never going to win Bill Murray. Murray. You know, right. he's, Bill Murray's but, like, it, there's nothing I was going to do to win that guy over in the first place. So, but, but it's the people, the innovators in our society, the the people who change it, whether it's art or science or or whatever it might be. It's those people who are are, are trying to uh, maybe show people a new path or just be a, a different type of person that are criticized the most. So, if everybody listened to their critics we wouldn't have any greatness in this country or in this world. You know, if, if David Bowie listens to his critics when he was a folk singer and said, you're too weird and out there, you should just stop. We'd be robbed of a lot of amazing music. Exactly. Well, I mean, that kind of ties into... <laughs> uh, Rich, we went to school for radio. Uh, the program directors used to tell you that... or used to tell me they'd hate taking requests because if you really got down to it, you know, like point, you know, something percent of the audience is calling in and steering the radio station. They don't represent everybody else. So it's kind of kind of that principle, too. You know, if you listen to the small critical minority, right. you know, you're 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 not going to put it. You know, it's like you said, Aaron, a lot of great shit's going to be torpedoed if you're listening to the, you know, the the, the loud but vocal minority. And, yeah, and as a, a concept for this nation, you know, I wish I could remember the the quote. Who, I was listening to somebody being interviewed on public radio, and they're talking about how our democracy is set up to protect us from tyranny. That includes the tyranny of uh, coming from within our own borders, and the tyranny uh, of yeah. the majority. And the tyranny of the minor- minority. And uh, Congress has apparently forgotten that this week. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think they, they can do things. I think what's getting lost in the shuffle of all this is especially, it's been building. And it, I, I would say it, it really started building probably, I mean, like it, the spark was, was first, you know, caught flame probably with the Clinton era. It, 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 it got bigger with Bush kind of died down a little bit with 9-11 because for at least a few days, but for most people it lasted, you know, the feeling lasted a few months. We, we, you know, we weren't, we weren't just a country of, we weren't just a melting pot. We were all Americans, you know, and then eventually that feeling evaporated as it, as it, as it always does. Right. And some of and then us the election more American than others. And then the election of Obama came and we really saw that there was, a very large group to white people, and I'm not surprising. I'm not surprised at all at the size group to anybody who wasn't white of racists still in this country. And as long as the status quo was old white men are in office, they didn't feel the need to speak up unless they, they were in company they thought they were comfortable in. The minute Obama got elected, then all of a sudden they started speaking up in front of people. And they didn't give a shit who knew. And that just snowballed. And you had the Tea Party, and then we had the shit with <laughs> last year's election. And we've had everything that's happened post-election to the last two weeks. And it is affecting people at so deeply. It's getting scary now. It's getting to the point where people feel the need to either lash out at other people, because the violence on both sides is starting to get out of hand. And believe it or not, most of the violence coming from both sides is underreported. I don't know what the fuck happened, but I've you can watch people's cell phone videos, you can watch independent uh, of reporters videos of violence coming from the left, from the right, it doesn't matter. There's a ton of it to go around. And it, it ain't being played. All you see is the standard crowd shots of the fire and people just an aerial shot of people dancing around it like, you know, it's or what is partitioned shit. out to us by the media outlets. 
I'm putting that out. I'll, I'll say that. I'll put my signature on that one. But also, it's starting to affect certain people to where they're, it's fucking with their day-to-day life, their happiness. <laughs> yeah. Dude, they're I'm, not even lashing out at other people. They're lashing out at themselves. They're letting, it con- they're letting themselves be consumed with all this shit. And it's like, look, yes, it is important to, to, to do something. It is important, but sometimes, you know, starting a riot, yeah. it, very, very few times it's the right thing to do. Most of the time, if you're thinking of starting a riot, it's not the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. You know, harming another person, harming yourself, not the right thing to fucking do, you know? Well, Rich, you know, I, I could, we could go on for another hour on this subject, and I don't really have the time for that, but I would like um, to, I would like to table this for next week. Because that's the conversation that I want to have. Is yeah, it's how, not exactly like it's going to go away, no, right? It's, it's going to be just as valid next week, absolutely. <laughs> but yeah, the, the the choices that we make and how much we tend to, how much we choose to consume of what's going on in the world, what we choose to do about it, and and what we consider healthy behavior. No, all right. Just I've told you guys stoner stories about me getting a little too paranoid in the airport. But one day I was sincerely anxious. I was at Detroit, I was at LAX, and I was flying into Portland. <laughs> Three airports that had prominent shit going on in them, and that whole protest shit over the weekend. So, no, I, I can understand how you can get caught up in it. Because, yeah, I mean, it's my, I was definitely, it was one of those things, like, man, am I going to be somewhere where shit's going to pop off? Right, and am I going to you know, be on the news next? Yeah, I mean, who knows? Is someone going to fucking come drop a bomb off at baggage claim? Who the fuck knows? You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, yeah. It's, you know, and even too, back, I, I was in New York on 9-11, crossing the bridge from Staten Island to Brooklyn a couple years ago. <laughs> you're, you're, and then and, uh, I was on the bridge between 8 and 9. You're damn right. I got a little bit more anxious. Then it's just because it's, it's thrown at you, and you start thinking about shit happening. Right. And I understand how people can get caught up in it. But, so, yeah. But next week. You know, I, but, I do like that. It, it does feel refreshing that we didn't rail about Trump for two whole hours. You, you know, we I, haven't done that for like, what, three months? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I could have talked a lot about about Trump this week, honestly. Oh, I tried, but, to, but, I tried to steer us there a couple times. You did not take the bait. Yeah, <laughs> I, I felt like once we got into the conversation, I was there was part of me that was consciously avoiding it. So, uh, Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's going to be... plenty of time. There's plenty well, you know what? <laughs> you know what? For the most part, this was a... more... I guess uh, introspective. I don't know if that's the right word. It's more philosophical uh, more th- debate. I tried to keep yes. it more f- philosophical and not so topical, even though a lot yes. of the stuff that we're talking about is what's happening in the world right now. But I you think know, you have I a better understanding people. for this shit if you understand it in the bigger context and not just think, well, shit's fucked up right now and that's why everything's so crazy. And as someone who who has been listening to a lot of older episodes before the 2016 election was talked about of our show, because I know for a fact we're not going to be talking about anything about it, because I can't listen to any other podcast about hearing shit. This was more of a throwback to our earlier episodes. I agree. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's not we necessarily a bad thing. We, we've got it used to be. up in it. So uh, maybe, maybe... Well, again, yeah. Pray to whatever deity you believe in, and a few months will hit our groove... We'll settle in, <laughs> and we won't be in the wake of a bunch of bullshit with the boat constantly rocking, and we can have more episodes where we can talk about subjects that necessarily aren't being, you know, we're not talking about, you know, just holy shit, can you believe what <laughs> so-and-so did this week, you know, and, and, and then how these people reacted and how nothing's being done and it's just the same old shit. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss type shit, so... Yeah, but this one's definitely struck a chord with a good portion of the population. Like oh, people are has. people are riled up. It has, and I, I can't I can't argue with it. And there's no way I can spin it to even try to get some positivity at the last minute out of that. So, hey, I did I did actually like fake tears, Chuck Schumer. I did like 
I did like him calling out somebody with their fake bullshit. I did. But, well, well, I actually, I was, uh, I, I know I just said it out loud that I liked something that he did, but huh, I thought it was, you know, you don't see that. People calling out the, the grandstanding, the fucking uh, pandering. I thought, I, I liked the style of that, I guess. I, yeah, I mean, I can't say that everything Trump is doing is fucked up. Um, for for all the rumors about his association with Russia, the, um, they actually took a, a pretty hard-line stance with them on Crimea this week. Uh, took a hard-line stance with Iran, too. I, they did a missile test, which was <laughs> they're, clearly... They're on notice. Clearly meant to... Uh, meant to test our new president. And while he did, re- of course, is an, he always goes with the initial reaction through the tweet, which to be on notice means absolutely nothing. And it's almost folly to give warnings without policy to back it up. But same day, they did back it up with policy and say that if uh, they don't stop missile testing, there's going to be increased sanctions. And then that stuff with Australia? Oh, and I guess, Israel. Huh? I didn't think that was a big deal. I don't oh. think... No, you, you keep them. You, they're right. already there. Why do, we got enough coming over here. I don't know. I didn't think that was such a big deal. Um, like, yeah, and, and he also told Israel, maybe it's not such a good idea to expand uh, expand housing in the Gaza Strip. I agree yeah. with that. But anyway, but yeah, I guess that's Congress the best positives back. that we can come up with is uh, the things that we agree with on, with Trump on. Uh, and then Congress today rolled back uh, the Obama's background restrictions for uh, background check restrictions for guns. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's your there's your Republican Congress, everybody. Yeehaw! All right, so, so you know we said we were going to do it. All right, <laughs> we'll just wrap it up. <laughs> yep. And we'll thank everybody who listens, who's downloaded. Motherfuckers, I, I didn't say a fucking word through all that. So no, I know. Shit on me. I know. <laughs> no, I, 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 it's accountability. That's what I said. It's all right, <laughs> but. Hey, it's, by the way, if you're hearing this, hey, we made it. We had some issues with the domain this week. Whatever. It, it's fixed. Uh, yeah. I, I, I could have went on a long rant about that and fucked up. How can one company have three customer service departments? But we'll <laughs> save that story for hey, another they day. Suck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you can, thanks for downloading us on iTunes and at ChristopherMedia.net. We're also on Google Play, Stitcher. We got the streaming station. Uh, you can just go to ChristopherMedia.net. Let's do it there. We're on TuneIn. We're in a whole bunch of other places. And yeah, every month you getting bigger than the next month. Tell somebody. That's how this shit grows, man. If you like it, share it. We made it easy at ChristopherMedia.net for you to share it on any of the social media platforms that you're on. So, that being said, hey, we did it. Week two. Uh, 406, we, or 206 weeks left. <laughs> oh, All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll catch everybody next week. Yep, thanks for All listening. All right. Later, guys. Time. If you enjoy this show and want more people to know about it, head on over to iTunes, leave a comment, and rate it five stars. Make sure you like and share us on Facebook, and don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Just search for Christopher Media. Thank you in advance for supporting Christopher Media by clicking on the PayPal button and by clicking through to all the sponsors who support ChristopherMedia.net. Most importantly, we would like to take the time to extend an extra special thanks to you. Christopher Media could not exist without your support. Thank you for visiting ChristopherMedia.net, and thank you for for listening. Christopher Media, let's make some noise. Thank you for visiting ChristopherMedia.net.